Hey everyone, welcome to episode 81 of the Sarah's Podcast. I'm your host, Stelios, and in this episode, I'll be chatting to a good friend of mine, Nick Damarakis from Athena's Fish and Chips in Bexhill on Sea. This is actually a joint sort of episode, really. This sort of folds in all the questions that we've received, or most of the questions that we received, because there were some duplicates and so on. But it's also a conversation with my mate Nick. So, you know, it's just very chilled, very easy going. But we do answer your questions. And I think that I think that it makes for a better podcast that we actually have a conversation about the questions as opposed to me just answering your questions dryly. So, you know, Nick's got a very similar sort of you know, upbringing to me. We both came into the industry in a very similar way. Um, so I just thought it'd be good. And, you know, some of the questions were, you know, asking about aggregators and TripAdvisor and stuff like that. And Nick's actually got experience with that, whereas I probably don't as much. So that's why we got him on board. He didn't want to do the podcast. like he, He's just shy. And he just said, no, I'm not interested. I'll help you do the questions, but I don't want to do the podcast. And But we bent his arm hard and he came on. So, you know, credit to him. So a little update about our articles on the website. Um, we've published two case studies this month. Um, really, we weren't going to do any of this month. We were going to wait till January, but we thought, no, they're really important. We like them, so why not? So one case study was about two sisters who have gone and set up their own fish and chip shop in Lincoln. I'd like to take this opportunity to sort of acknowledge and, and tell the world that Lauren and Rachel have gone and set up their own fish and chip shop after working for years in their father's business, which, again, it's hard. I know what it's like to leave a family business, you know, so credit to them. And, you know, they've gone from elite and now they're at, Sisters Fish and Chips in Lincoln, North Highcombe. So well done to those girls. And, you know, one thing that we sort of shed on in the article that's really important, it's not just, oh, they use Sarah's. It's not about that. You know, the boring articles, to be fair, they are. What this is about is two ladies that defied all odds to, you know, go get funding, chase it down, chase the shop, get what they wanted. And then when they did get the keys... They, within a week, they turned around this shop. It might have been less, you know, they, they, you know, ultra focus, you know, and they got what they wanted and they made it work. And now the shop's a great success. And I think they've got many years of success ahead of them because they're both switched on and they both made it work, you know, so well done to them. And they're not afraid of hard work. I went there to drop off some batter last week. They were both peeling spuds. So they're not afraid of hard work, put it that way. So good luck to those girls. And the second case study is with Ricky Knowlton from Ricky's in Southbourne near Bournemouth. He's ventured out after many years of being a chef. Anyway, he still is a chef. And I visited him just before lockdown and the smells coming out of his kitchen were absolutely mental. You know, it, it just well done to the guy. He's again, another one setting up a business. There's a pandemic all over us. And, you know, he's just doing his thing and he's really happy. Easy go lucky, like really honest. No stress, no drama, just turfing out great products. And I think it would be interesting to see how both these businesses develop in the current climate. Well, everyone's business, including mine and yours. So <clears throat> moving on, we recently published a year in review. I wrote it, had some help because apparently I can't write. So, you know, I know you pretty much can guess what happened in 2020, but I want to make a habit of writing down some thoughts for us all to consider. It will be interesting to see how businesses evolve over 2021. I think I, could, I covered many important topics, and it's really important that we don't forget the important lessons that we've learned in 2020. I do believe that we are more resilient than what we believe. So, you know, we've got it in us to, to go through these hard times. On top of that, I've been speaking about it for a few weeks now. You may also know that we've put together a free template and guide to write to your local MP. You know what? Invite them round. Start talking to them. Don't be shy. Really press them on VAT. Explain to them. We've put talking points together on our website. Set up a, gro of, a group of local restaurant owners, chip shop owners, anyone in hospitality. They're all going to want to keep that at 5%. And I do think that you know, with a bit of effort, we might be able to keep it at 5% for another year or something. But what we really want is, you know, massive reform on that because 20% is just incredibly high and it's just, it's not right. If you want to download the letter, it's on our online shop. It's free, of course. Don't worry about it. It's all zeros. You just download it and then we'll send you some information, some talking points later on by email. It's really easy. And if you do lose track of the email, you just log back into the website and off you go. As always, <clears throat> we love feedback. You know, if there's anything we could be doing better, let us know. That's what we're all about. Nick, 
Welcome to the Sarah's podcast. Nice to be here. Nick, for those who don't know you, mate, because many may not know you, you're Nick from Athena's in Bexhill. I don't want to act like we don't know each other, because obviously we know each other really well. You know, looking back over the, the last few years, you were quite instrumental in me doing the podcast. And, I, and I've been saying to you for ages, like, oh, you know, you should come on the podcast. And every time it was like, nah, nah, not going to do it. Nah, nah. Yeah, well, and, you, you beat me down on that one. And and then yesterday it was like, well, two days ago, it was like, yeah, you know what? I'll do it. Like, I'll do it. And I think, and I think, you know, it, it's about time really that you've come on. Yeah, well, I think, I think, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I think you do a great job, to be honest. I, I listen to them all, as you well know. Uh, <laughs> but I do you know, force you. Yeah, yeah, you do. For, have you listened yet? Have you listened yet? <laughs> what do I always say? You always say that I'm at the back of the queue, which f's me off big time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got like eighteen, and then I'll be to your one. But no, joking yeah. aside, I, I do. Believe, I do think you do a good job, and we talk about this quite often. We both uh, started to listen to podcasts around the same time. It would, I reckon, it was about two and a half, three years ago. So uh, it's funny to to be. Now, three years later, on a podcast you host. So, yeah, yeah. well done. Where, where, where are you at now? Nearly 100? 82, I think, 83, something like that. To give people a background of what this this podcast is going to be about is essentially the Q&A that I've sort of been not advertising or marketing, let's say. You know, people send their questions, and me and you were sort of going through the questions anyway. And I think that's what just made me say, like, why don't you come on and we can just answer them together and have a bit of background about you and your situation and everything that's sort of going on. Some of the questions you're quite, you know, knowledgeable on. Um, so we were meant to be doing this tomorrow. Just for reference, this is Boxing Night. Yeah. <laughs> we were meant to be doing a podcast tomorrow which is the sunday but i was sitting watching 300 you know the spartans yeah and i was pretty much enjoying it and then you're like should we do the podcast right now and i was like uh okay yeah well <laughs> so, i thought i thought it'd be best if we did it now due to the fact that the kids are asleep and uh, get free reign and also possibly the nerves of being on all night i wouldn't have slept well so i thought let's just do it yeah again like obviously there is nothing to be nervous about i assure you you know this is just you know (laughs) sarah's podcast mate (laughs) i was joking earlier when i said you hit the peak like this is big time big time (laughs) what one of the one of the funny things that i always attribute you to in the industry is that i I definitely think you was one of the first people in the industry to put chopped parsley on fish (laughs) chips (laughs) <laughs> uh, straight into the deep end I like it yeah well I won't uh, claim that that was my idea but definitely um, I did post a lot about the chopped parsley I got a lot of grief from uh, a Mark Drummond who was constantly going on about putting grass on fish and chips <laughs> so uh, you, gotta, uh, you, you, you gotta admit he's relentless though oh god yeah he he never stopped but uh, I like it. I like. I like. I like the banter. And to be honest, I like. I like the idea at the time. Uh, funny though, now we we stopped doing it quite a while ago, probably a couple of years ago. But I have noticed recently, maybe a year or so ago, actually, uh, Miller's took it one step further and cut it up and put it on the lemon. And I thought that was a real cool touch. I like that. One thing I hate about people that put lemon on fish and chips. Because you know I love lemon. Like, that's yeah. not the problem. It's just putting a skinny piece of lemon. Like, what's the point? It's just as useless as that parsley that goes on top. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a look thing. It's aesthetics. It's not It's not yeah, really a function of I'm of a utilitarian. I'm a utilitarian, okay. though. Like, everything has to have utility. Like, yeah. you know, the packaging holds the food, keeps it warm. You know, parsley for me, and it never did it for me. It made it look nice. It made it very Instagrammable. You know, yeah, um, definitely. You know, yeah, but I think it was better than just having a little bit cut off and put in there. You know, this at least you're you're actually eating this. How many people would eat a, a little bit of parsley cut off? No, no one's going to eat that. That's a garnish. At least that's so what warm the fish. Yes, yeah, talking. Listen, of parsley. listen to me defending it. <laughs> talking of parsley once more, just to go back there because you have got this weird fetish with parsley. <laughs> because when we were doing the fish cake photos at your shop that time, not long ago, yeah. you put this huge leaf of parsley yeah. on the plate, and I was like, "It looks wrong." And you're like, "No, it looks good." And I was like, but it's huge. Like, it was like <laughs> it was like, 
Did you use that like, I did use it, but it was just <laughs> like <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised no one wondered if it was a fish cake recipe or a parsley recipe yeah. because it, it was such a big, huge leaf of parsley. And I thought to myself, let's not argue with him. Like, I'm in the guy's shop. Like, yeah. his you got to roll with the parsley. If he wants to put a whole, <laughs> if he wants to put a whole plant of parsley on there, let him. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, but no, I do think like you know, it is like. I do think, yeah, a bit of green goes a long way because fish and chips can be brown. Curry sauce is brown, you know, and not not, not strictly brown, but golden as such. So, yeah, yeah, you can see how green does make something very Instagrammable, you know? Yeah, it it, it added something at the time no one else... I mean, we laugh about it now. We see it on on quite a few different posts. And I'm not saying that I started that, but, it, you know, it, it does photo well. And it, at the time, it was quite different. And especially for the area I'm in, no one else was doing anything like that. And I just rolled with it. But like I said, you know, we, we have stopped doing it because, to be honest, it's a pain in the ass. You know, sometimes it's too wet. Sometimes the staff accidentally put it on someone that didn't want it. And then I get so, you know, in the in the end, it was just easier to stop doing it. I think, didn't I suggest at the time maybe doing, um, uh, what was it, uh, curly parsley? And like blended it, but you said it wouldn't work either, did you? I think. Yeah, I think I tried. I think I tried it, um, and you know, I, I do like the garnish when they put a little bit of curly parsley in there. I think oyster shell or, or scallop shell, either one. I think they do it the way they they frame their photos. You know, it just it just elevates it, and I, whether that's right or wrong is is arguable. But I, I think it does. It can it can look pretty cool. We tried, we tried it, you know, trying to dry it out. It's difficult, but yeah, good, good rinse to it. What, what, one of the things that we have, like, that's probably quite similar, is that we both sort of came up through a family business. You know, you were with your dad, I were with my dad and my brother. Um, what was it sort of like coming up for you, like at the time? Like, what was it like working with your dad in that environment? Well, like most people, you know, we but we butted heads. Obviously, I I wanted to 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 go in a different direction to he was happy doing what he was doing and and that that's cool and in retrospect looking back what he wanted to do then and what he's continued to do is correct for his location and that's fine but I wanted to go in a different direction so we butted heads a lot in the end we never really worked together after the initial training period where um you know you watch things like uh how Marco Pierre White was and and all the rest of the top chefs, Gordon Ramsay, you know, we had a few screaming matches like, well, he would scream at me and it, it was embarrassing in front of customers. But he didn't mean it badly, you know, under the pressure in a fish and chip shop. You know what it's like. And if you do something wrong, you get told off. I, I know you've told the story before that so your dad was kicking you under the counter. I was just thinking of that. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking- <laughs> yeah he, he never got physical with me. So you've got me yeah. on that one. I remember my dad, like, he didn't even trade me. <laughs> he was like, you're going to work tonight. And I was like, really? Yeah. You have to. And, yeah. <laughs> and I remember, like, I just did a bag of chips. I was sort of looking at him, like, thinking, when do I stop? I don't bloody yeah. know when to stop. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, no, he, he, he threw me in the deep end as well. Just sort of left me to it. I had to learn quickly what was sort of right and wrong. Um, I still am, to be honest with you. It's ever-changing. Yeah. I, but, I, I must admit, when I was, like, 15-ish, I was still at school. I had to do two hours a night and I got it down like like proper good at like hiding. So <laughs> I'd like, I, like, I think for the whole year of my 15th to 16th year, I must have had diarrhea every night for two hours. <laughs> and I'd just hide in the toilet. <laughs> I'd just hide in the shop toilet. And I remember dad was like, oh my God, no one could have diarrhea that much. And it's that same time, mom, take him to the play doctor. <laughs> and I remember, I remember once he went, because we had like a shelf in the in the toilet and he went in there to grab some toilet roll and had a book hidden in the corner and the book <laughs> fell and hit him on the head. Yeah, he didn't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose uh, iPhones didn't exist then, did they? Not at all. Like, so, yeah, you know, you're trying no. to kill time in the toilet. Like, yeah. and, I, and I remember I'd come out like 10 minutes before because I thought, all right, let's not take the piss. And, <laughs> like, and, yeah. I'd come out, and then someone would say, we need something from the shed. And I'd just wander off up to the shed. Like, and I'd just be there for like another 10 minutes. Like, but I, I absolutely hated it. 
like I mean like I hated like just like I, I think I told you before I wanted to be a chef you know I went to like sign up at chef school and like you know the drama oh my god like but it was just like yeah like I don't know working with family was so hard for me and I know others get on really well with it which is cool but I always think there's a compromise when you work for someone like well sorry when you work for your dad there's always going to be a compromise the fact is it's their business they came first you know what I mean so you know and especially at 15 16 you're not going to change their mind are you yeah no you're, t- you're totally right obviously you need to get you get to a stage where you realize you're not going to change anything they are they are the boss and you just got to roll with it. What, what did you want to do? No, well, my parents ran a hotel for almost 20 years. My dad was the chef in the hotel um, when when they finally sold that, because that was that was a real hard slog. You know, I watched them work very hard, and I, I helped out a lot there. When, then they bought this fish and chip shop, and I, I'd gone up to help them. To be honest, I, I, at the time, I was uh, doing an electrical apprenticeship, but that really wasn't for me, and I, I knew that wasn't for me. Knowing what I know now, I probably, like yourself, would have would have liked to have gone down the catering chef route, potentially. Not that that's easy, and I'm not saying it is, but I think that would have been quite quite a cool career. But I love what I do. So during this whole lockdown, how has that been for you? And again, I don't want to sound disingenuous, because I do know, but you know, for the benefit yeah. of the listener. Well, for the benefit of the listeners, like most people, when we first heard it, we decided to close. Now, I can't remember the exact dates, but it was the day before McDonald's announced they were closing. And like probably most people at the time, we were scared. We didn't know what this was. I thought if this could be the end of the world. I didn't know. <laughs> you know, I'm not. So so we closed the doors. I didn't want to, but we did. I had a click and collect in place. I was already with Prio Day. You know, in hindsight, obviously, now knowing what I know, I wouldn't have would have kept it going. But we closed the doors for, I can't remember how many weeks, eight maybe. And then we reopened with a, we'd already had the click and collect via Prio Day. We added the delivery. So we, we added a second site because with Prio Day, they've got a, a bit of a sort of, not a glitch, but to have the different times and, and set it up, you need two, two sites. So it costs us a little bit more money. I'm not, I'm not knocking Prio Day. I think they're great. They're definitely the best out there currently. You know, thank God that they, they were there. And luckily, I, like I said, I had it, I had already had it in place. So we just put a table in front of the door, pre-orders only. I mean, at first we made mistakes. Um, you know, I spoke to, to Fred who, who was doing it as well like that. Obviously a completely different setup. He was taking orders at the door, I believe. So I, th- I felt like I had to do that. That was wrong. We, I couldn't do that. You know, we were doing, I think it was at the time when we first reopened, was just me and my wife for the first few weeks. We were doing three every 15 minutes. And then people would come to the door. Where do they fit in? You know, the time it takes to take their order, cards only. You know, it caused problems. You know, and we, we, we had issues with it. So eventually I had to say, I just had to, to say no. I did take a few that were really elderly. I knew well, they didn't have the internet, you know, they couldn't do it. I couldn't turn them away and I still don't. But I do encourage most people to to please just download the app and order that way. So just sort of see like click and click for you anyway, just see it staying now. If If there's a way I can do it, that this is, Click and collect for me feels like the future, no doubt. Uh, we discussed it just the other day, didn't we? Um, I think I messaged you about the new click and drive. Is it click and drive McDonald's launch? Yeah, uh, I think so, yeah. So, something along them lines. Uh, I guess they've been parked up, in fairness. Yeah, they're parked up. It's, it's a great idea. It, it, we, we sort of tried this virtual drive through, which was actually Robert Florigo's idea five years ago. He, 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 no, sorry, six years ago when we opened, he, he said to me, look, it's a busy road. Why don't you try and do a virtual drive through? And at the time I thought, oh, God, I didn't even want to touch that idea, but you know, he's quite smart, really. Don't tell him. Everything, everything has a place at some point, doesn't it? And I think like, you know, like it's funny because if my brother listens to this, he'll laugh because I had this idea about what this crazy idea a few years ago. Our shop's quite well. My dad, my dad's shop, which I always refer to as ours, it's not mine, but theirs, and it's a very narrow shop. 
And we used to get people come in the shop with mobility scooters. <laughs> And it used to really grind my gears because it was a narrow shop and they'd come in with mobility scooters. <laughs> so I got a sign made from the guy up the road and uh, it just said mobility drive through. We'd open a window at the front and let the mobility scooters come up and get it. Well, the going joke was that only, you know, Tony and the mobility scooter used it because like nobody else would use it. And like, and they'd literally come there order their food. And my brother even makes fun of it today. And he's like, but I think that the idea was that at least you got them out of the bloody queue because, yeah. you know, a mo- you know, a mobility scooter in a bloody narrow shop was just stupid. Like, yeah. you know, and I think, and, and, and I understand why they didn't want to leave it outside either. But, yeah, they still joke about it now, to be honest. But I think, yeah, old ideas, especially now, like they, they do have some sort of relevance now, don't they? And, oh, and def- I think- definitely. Uh, I totally agree with that. The problem is what, what I foresee, um, let's say it gets back to normal in a year's time. It's a Friday night. Everyone knows what that's like in this industry. You've got however many click and collects, deliveries. Then you've got the queue. Where, where does it all fit in? How, how do you prioritize who comes first, who comes last, who, you know, it, there's, there's problems with it. And is it your, is it, um, sorry, I can't remember the people in Devon, Krispies. Yeah. They open a strictly just click and collect and delivery shop. Yeah. Yeah. See, I would love to, my shop just to be that. Uh, I am in a, in a high street in the middle of town, so I don't know how that would work. <laughs> Um, and there's certain people that just would never do that, being that, you know, I'm in Bexhill, close to Eastbourne, Hastings, and, you know, it's um, the demographic. They're old. It's uh, So there's going to be certain people that won't. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think you've just got to do what works for your area. Like, you know, you, you know, you mentioned Fred Capel earlier, and, and you know, he's got a different setup. He's got a wider shop, bigger shop. And, you know, he's the, the parking situation is different. It's not great parking anyway. I don't know if you've ever been there, but but it's not as bad as yours. You know, he's got a loading bay outside, you know, your place. I can barely, you know, how many times have I been to your place? I can barely find a parking space. Oh, yeah. You know? ours, is, ours is horrendous. Um, we, we had a Weatherspoons, uh, I believe it's two or 300 seat, three story Weatherspoons open. Uh, a few years back and the road was bad before and now it's just horrendous it's, what was it's it like horrendous. when you reopened after lockdown and weather spoons were still shut better <laughs> yeah to be honest it was it was better it was better for parking it was it was easier for us i mean once they reopened uh we we've always closed early then at the moment we're actually trading three evenings five till half past seven and then i shut the doors and we go home so by half eight i'm outside walking to the car uh, and when they had reopened, they and it was the help out to eat out. They were queuing. There were maybe a hundred people outside queuing to get in, and I get it, but it's quite heartbreaking, <laughs> you know. Nevertheless, when you walk past that and you see and you think, Jesus, wow, you know. And there's potentially okay, there wouldn't have been three hundred because they wouldn't have been able to be at their capacity. But say there was already one hundred and fifty people in there, and then there's another hundred people outside waiting to get in. You sort of think, God, what, what, what have you got to do to compete with that? I guess you've got to be dead cheap. You know, being that we're a takeaway and they're a sit down, you know, it's, it's different. Yeah, but again, look, they've always going to have that advantage because humans are social eaters. You know, they like to be social. They go to the pub, have something to eat. So those that are going to the pub are already probably thinking of going out anyway. I guess maybe it's not your average takeaway customer, but I suppose when you pile on, eat out to help out, and the fact that Weatherspoons is already dead cheap. Yeah, I think that probably just exacerbates it. But I think Bexhill is a bit of a strange area, though. Like, you know, I, you know, even just driving around trying to find a parking space, I think to myself, there's all these people. <laughs> Remember how stressed I was that time when I came to your place? They're like, yeah. they're like, you know, I went to find a parking space and someone cut me up. Like, you just think, what the hell is going on here? Like, yeah, and it just, like, yeah. you know, and you know, you walk down the street, like, you know, to come to your shop, and like people literally look at you like you got four legs. You know, and you think it's just a bit. It's I don't know. It's a bit. I can't, I can't place the area. I don't know. I just I, I can't place with the oddness about it. Yeah, I mean, you you go to a lot of places, so you you see different things. To me, it's, it feels quite normal. I'd say yeah, in a sense. Um, but yeah, I, I know I do, I do. I know what you mean. But everywhere's got their quirks. Maybe it's because yeah. it's this side of the coast, you know. I think the further down you go, Devon Way, more relaxed, maybe more affluent. 
potentially. I guess I, what, what, what one thing that probably struck me with Bexil on C, and it might be odd not to think like this, I've got no data that supports it, but it feels like the people that are, are there have been retired for a while and they like to make their money stretch for as long as possible. And I get that too. And I, I wonder if, like they've just they've got into their own ways. They they're set in their own ways. And then you've got a lot of younger people that probably don't have a job, so they're probably sort of like, you know, not doing so well. I I, I don't know. There wasn't a lot of aside from Hastings Direct and a few big supermarkets. I don't think there's some, a lot of massive employers down there, is there? No, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, they love their value for money. We when I I first opened, we we did a mini a mini cod meal. So it was a, around a three to four ounce piece of fish, cod, uh, six ounce chips, or between three and three and six ounce chips, somewhere around there. I can't remember exactly, six years ago now. And a, a three, three ounce pot of peas or curry or homemade tartar. And I think it was £3.49. And we did it and it was really popular. And then eventually, maybe a year later, I had to up the price. You know, it was really cheap. So I took yeah. it up to three ninety nine. And my God, <laughs> you know, I had a, a few people. I remember one guy coming in, you know, this is outrageous, outrageous, and just left. And I thought, wow, wow, you know, 49p after a year or so, things had gone up. What what could I do? I think oil had gone up to, you know, I was on ground nut and uh, I think I was paying like 25 at the time and it had gone up to 35. You know, there must have been some shortage or something. You know, things had crept up and – it, you know the the percentage just wasn't right so i had to do something about it but yeah they're very stuck you you have to be really careful with your price in there yeah i'm not laughing to be insensitive i'm laughing because we've spent many hours over the years talking about this so like, and like and i, I feel like you know, one day one of our deathbeds we're going to be talking about it but like <laughs> like it is really strange how like you, you know you, over the years especially like you know you, you've admitted freely that you've made mistakes early on and like oh yeah and and you know you've tried to offer better value and people just don't get it they just see what they see and that's it and then you know and it's, it must be really frustrating like Matt, well, oh, I know it's frustrating. oh yeah you know it's frustrating but for for the people listening and you know many of them will feel the same or gone through the same like you said yeah i made made plenty of mistakes uh, at the beginning and I continue to obviously because in hindsight you look back and go oh that was a mistake but you know the problem with trying to use better things in my eyes right or wrong like say ground nut over palm or bio boxes paper bags no pa- you know uh, no plastic biodegradable pots uh, and and all things down that nature it costs money it costs money, and a lot of people don't see the value in that. And they, they see now, as it stands, there's nine other, well, eight other fish and chip shops plus me. At the time, there were six plus me, so, so two have reopened or opened. And, um, you know, a lot of them are like, well, how comes it's – I've, I've had someone before say to me, yeah, but it's a pound cheaper down the road. And, you know, I, I get bored of having to say, yeah, but they're frying ground nut. Are their boxes biodegradable? They give you a paper bag. Do they do this? Do they... It's boring. It's boring. Yeah. I mean, mm. when I was in the chip shop before we opened a shop, and it was very in a very highly competitive area, and I remember you, you get the odd person in the queue, and they're like, oh, it's bloody expensive here. And you're like, well, okay, really sorry about that. But why are you here? <laughs> like, you know, yeah. And, yeah, and you, you just wanted to say, like, you know, why are you here? And I remember once, I, the guy actually called me over. We've got an island range. So I walk over. So I have to get one of the staff to come off the front to go around the front, you know. So I walk around. Yes, sir. Bloody expensive here. Eh? I can get fish and chips up the road for, like, 60 less. I was like, go. Like, you know, I'm not being funny. Like, can't you see I was busy over there? Like, you yeah. just called me over. Well, me. I, yeah. I had a phone call on a Friday night. This was a few years ago, and it's, like, etched in my memory because of uh, the phone rings. And at the... Currently, I don't actually answer the phone anymore. I let it go to answer phone because <laughs> I just can't deal with it during shift. So uh, at the time I was answering the phone, we were probably taking telephone orders when we were ju- with Just Eat as well as using Just Eat and in So I answered the phone and a, a man says, uh, I want to speak to the, the manager. I said, oh, yeah, well, you're speaking to the owner. How can I help you? And he, he just said, uh, you know, I've just called you to tell you I think your prices are outrageous. 
<laughs> I didn't know what to say to him. I was like, oh, okay, uh, anything else? He's like, no, just that. I was like, well, well, thank you for the phone call. And he put the phone down. And I just, I, I really, I still don't know. How, how, what do you say to that? How would you deal with that? I don't think I'd say anything. I, I think I'd do very much what you did. I'd just say, thanks, mate, catch you later. Yeah. Like, you know, you know, but, you know, that, that, that guy that called me over once, he was like, you know, the other customers started to deal with it. And they were like, well, look, look mate, if you don't like it, you know, F off up the road then. And he was like, yeah, yeah but the food's better here. And like, and it, it, you give them enough rope, they hang themselves. But I suppose over a phone, what can you do? Like, yeah. you know, like the, once when we, when we, we just brought out our fish cake mix years ago now, like where it was at the shop. And I remember customer calls me over. So I'm still working part time, both jobs. Yeah. So customer calls me over. So I like get one member of staff to come out the range so I can go deal with this customer. And I was just like, and one thing I always want to do is train the staff to deal with this because I couldn't be bothered. Like, so I was like, yes, sir. Opens this, you know, fish and chips, fish cake and chips, opens it. He goes, pokes at it with a pen. He goes, what's that? I was like, it's fish <laughs> in the fish cake. <laughs> and I was, he goes, what do you mean it's fish? I was like, fish? Like, you know, like, <laughs> I was just like, fish? Like, when you, and he was like, what's it doing in a fish cake? And I was like, I just looked at him and, and, and like, I think he, it's not all his fault, in all fairness. Like, you got to admit, like, you know, you, you know, if you've ever had a King Frost fish cake, it's, you know, uh, yeah, it's, 30% it's just potato, minced right? white fish. It's a paste and potato in it. Yeah. So, you know, you know, it's the prawn toast of fish cakes, isn't it? Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, so, you know, so you know, I just said to him, I said, look, I said, I wasn't in the mood, but I said, I'll tell you what, you've ruined your meal purely out of, you didn't understand what it was. <laughs> so, stupidity. <laughs> Like, but I felt sorry for him at yeah. like, the same time. So I said to Shona, who was working at the time, I said, look, wrap him up with the fish cake and chips. Like, <laughs> and I just sort of went back behind the island range. And this is why I love an island range. I was just yeah. sort of swearing to myself, thinking, shoot me now. Like, you know, but I really kept it composed at the time. Like, but that was one of those where he didn't genuinely know. He was genuinely perplexed. Like, you know, and, and I think, you, you know, you can, and I've always said to you, me and you've had these arguments, haven't we, where, you know, I'll always say to you, look, you know, if you deal with a complaint, you can, you know, you build a customer for life. And you're like, damn, I'm not it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, and, you, know, like, you know, and I know one of your arguments has always been, still, what would you have done? And I, it does baffle me because I don't know what I would have done. And I really think there is some, you know, weirdness it down there. It's it's hard to deal with on the fly, and like we we've said, and it, it'll be a something we'll probably repeat through this whole podcast. Mistakes have been made, um, and I deal how I deal with complaints now. Not that we get many, is is nowhere near in the same manner that I deal with how I dealt with complaints back then. Again, one thing we've we spoke about, especially since doing the podcast, is but we've heard other people say how they deal with complaints, or even TripAdvisor reviews, and I think you know, I think you're you're quick to admit that. In the early days, you would have took it very personally, like so. Well, I, I James did. <laughs> Again, you coined the term "James did." Yeah, and, James did. And I've tried to explain it on the podcasts over the years, and and, and you're like, "No, you're butchering it." And, yeah, and, you do, you do butcher it. You butcher. It. <laughs> Let me explain it for people. Oh, so James, crazy. James is so eloquent in the way that he replies to a customer. <laughs> James Ritchie, yeah. explain it. Yeah, James, yeah, from Simpsons, James. And uh, years ago, I admired that. I still admire it. I, I'm not. I admired the way he would put it together. He, it was brilliant, and I felt like that was the best way to deal with it at the time. In retrospect, looking back, it isn't because what happened is uh, they would they would leave me a bad review, and again, out of almost 400, I might have 15. I, I don't know the numbers, but not many. Um, so what would happen is I would they'd leave a review and I would basically James them in a really really bad way, and then what would happen the next day I'd wake up and they because they can't reply on TripAdvisor they'll reply on Google or on Facebook. So you shoot yourself. So so ultimately you get to a stage where you say you know what this isn't the way to deal with it. I think I think one of the things I said back then is that you were literally playing a game of whack a mole. Like, and because they'd come up everywhere, like, you know, they'd end up yeah. in the group, like you say, Google. And it's just like, and that wasn't a way to deal with it. And I think that I understand why James did it. And I understand because it is frustrating. There is no doubt. It was, different. Like, it was, I know it was only a few years ago, but it was different then. I'll be honest, it yeah. was different. Um, you know, this was possibly maybe 10 years ago when I first started to see, you know, 
James do what he did on TripAdvisor. Do you think, do you think people have sort of? Do you think consumers have got a bit better now? Maybe potentially, like, potentially, maybe slightly. Uh, it, it does surprise me that people would leave a bad review in these times. Like I've seen yeah. some, not not from me, for for others, you know, complaining about limited yeah. time or limited menu and things of that nature. So I think it, it's it's down to the individual. There's some spiteful people out there that that yeah. would, but yeah, I think that has there's changed. Always, there's always someone out there that thinks you're doing all right because you've got a business. They don't realise they've got kids to feed. They yeah. Don't, they don't well, care, they don't, it, it isn't just that they don't see the mental side of. I'm not. I'm not being funny. How how much I took it personally six years ago when I had everything on the line to open that business. And I mean, everything plus, I don't know, 90,000 pound in the hole, as well as what I'd spent. You got a lot riding on it and that's a lot of pressure. And then, you know, if someone leaves a review that, that, you know, isn't fair, you know, you, you really do take it personally, but I've learned a lot from all that. And now I, t- I take it really differently. And Fred's helped me with that, to be honest. Again, we'll probably discuss him a little bit through this. But he, you know, like he, he said a few years back when I was having, you know, it was affecting me slightly. I contact them privately, you know, ask them, you know, what you can do, you know, how you can help them, you know, apologize, whatever it takes sort of thing. But that's all fine and well, but a lot of the time they don't delete it anyway. So what's the point? Well, that happened recently, didn't it? Didn't someone well, give us that example that happened recently? That- <laughs> so a guy, a guy leaves them. Um, I, I do my best not to, to go on the app too much. I really do. <clears throat> I used to be on it multiple times a day. I was terrible. So recently someone left a review. I don't know how many days it'd been up there saying that I changed They'd left me a one-star review on TripAdvisor because the minimum order for delivery had gone up five pound from fifteen to twenty. It took me a while to realise what what he meant by that because since lockdown and reopening and restarting delivery, which we hadn't done for about a year, I, I thought, well, oh, it's always been twenty since we reopened. So after a while, I wrapped my brains and I realised, oh, it was fifteen pound, maybe two years ago when I was with Just Eat. So firstly, this guy's complaining about it's gone up five pound uh, yet. He's probably not ordered from us in two years. So one, are you a customer? Can you call yourself a customer? Sorry, it's only a regular customer for Bexit. <laughs> yeah, but can, can, you know, can you call yourself a customer? If, if it was two years ago, you ate, you ate with me. Um, and he was, he was nice as well off the cuff. It was like, Oh, you know, definitely the best food, but now it, it's crazy. I'd like to see the owner eat 20 pounds worth of food. And, I could have replied and said, well, yeah, I could smash that quite easily, but <laughs> obviously I didn't. I messaged him privately, you know, through through it and, and explained he was wrong. But politely, it's actually £20. Yes, it may have been £15 two years ago. And would you consider move, removing the remo- review? Because, you know, it's not it's not really fair being that it's not really true. Uh, he never replied. But the, I, I did also contact TripAdvisor about it, even though they're useless. Um, so they would have emailed him too. And a couple of days later, it, it was gone. So I was glad for it to go, but I've had <laughs> previous ones. So uh, do you want me to tell the story about the guy that threatened me at the door? Yeah, no, that was what I meant, but you went on with another one. Oh, okay. One. Apologies, yeah. So uh, when we just reopened after lockdown... Um, we got the staff back off furlough. Uh, and so we'd upped it. I believe it was like four collections and one delivery. So on a Friday night, it could be quite hectic. You know, it's a lot of food to cook. Guy comes to the door. We've got signs up as well right there. So you, you can't miss it. You know, please download our app to order. Uh, like I said, I don't answer the phone because there's an answer phone message explaining that we don't. I don't answer the phone during shift. And... To visit our website or download our app to order. This is how we're doing it now. And all we do, all we were doing is doing what the government, what the council, sorry, had asked us to do. So this chap's come to the door. Um, my policy has changed now. I don't actually go to the door to talk to him anymore, <laughs> just because it's it's better coming from a Pretty female bad. member of staff. To be honest yeah. with you, uh, so I went to the door and he said, oh, "I've been calling nonstop." And I said, "Oh, did you hear the answer from Miss?" He's like, "Yeah." 
So at that point, really, we, we there was nothing else we should have spoken about because we called repeatedly and heard the answer machine. What what were we talking about? And I said, I'm really sorry, look, really busy. And I could see he had an iPhone in his hand. He was maybe five years older than me, mid forties. Yeah, he had an iPhone in his hand, so he could have easily done this. Uh, he got heated. I asked him to leave, and he threatened me. You know, as in. Oh, you better watch your back or something. I can't remember the exact words, and I'm not being funny. I'm not going to take that ever from anyone. So it got a little <laughs> bit heated, not physical in any way, obviously. Eventually, he leaves. What happens next day? I've, I've got a bad review, um, and I've had a comment on Facebook from his mum, who's been a customer apparently since the beginning of us opening, which is a real shame. So I explained to her what had happened, what her son had done. She didn't apologise, but she understood. And, you know, I said to her, look, really sorry, you know, that I got heated as well. And, yeah, I did swear at him because he threatened me with physical violence. You know, sorry, I lost it. Uh, So I apologised to her. And she's left a review on TripAdvisor. uh, And I said, now you know, obviously, the full story. I I hope you're going to review the trip, you know, remove the TripAdvisor review. She didn't. (laughs) (laughs) So I've got got a one-star review that I swore at a customer, <clears throat> you know, but not the full story, but what, what can you do in them? But to be honest, I'm cool about it. You know, six years ago, if that had happened, I would have been devastated. I really yeah. would have been upset. Be- Be- Bex Hill on sea sounds pretty gangland, doesn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it can be, but you, sh- you know, it- it's usually they're, they're elderly, but you know, they, they, they don't take, they don't take no crap basically. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, they know what they want. And that's what I mean by like, they're retired for such a long time that I think that it's almost like the grey pound in force. Like they, 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 they literally dictate in how they spend their money. And and if they don't like your attitude or whatever, if you didn't bend over enough or suck up enough, like that's it. Like they're just going to like leave your shit reviews all over the place and not. Yeah, well, speaking to other local traders, uh, I spoke to it. There's a real nice cafe a few doors down from me that they've been really affected when weather springs open. Uh, like a what do you call it? Like a mum and pup store. That's yeah. an American term, isn't it? But, you know, they're quite elderly now. One's Spanish, one is uh, from Switzerland or something. It's quite, quite a lovely family. And, um, you know, I'd go, I used to go in there for breakfast when I first opened it. And they tell me a little bit about how Bexhill is, you know, be careful with your pricing. People really want value here and, and things of that nature. And I sort of didn't really listen, if I'm being honest. Yeah, well, you, you said that as well about like the butcher as well, didn't you? Like, it's like yeah. you, you found it really strange that the butcher doesn't actually cut anything there; everything comes in packed. Yeah, and and they had no no. I went. I can't remember what steak I wanted. I think it was just a ribeye, which isn't an overly expensive steak. Um, and he was like, "No, we don't do that. They wouldn't pay for that." Here. And I was like, "Okay, uh, can I get some chicken?" And I'm not with any. And I said, oh, "I thought I'd ask." It's free range, isn't it? He's like, "No, it's it's." Cage, and I was like, no, I'm not. I, so I, I think I was actually at the time doing the chicken burgers. Do you remember when I did chicken burgers? And I was looking for a supply, and I thought I'd try someone up our road, but that wasn't something I really wanted to use. Yeah, it's like that veg shop we went to recently, isn't it? when I was there last, and I went to get some veg from those mushrooms. Yeah, <laughs> like, seriously, it was like cobwebs on the wall and everything. It's like, yeah, and you just think, but it's like, cheap. It's, it's cheap, cheap, and it's so busy, it's so busy in there. I remember going to pay for like this whole box of oyster mushrooms. <laughs> like, and, the, and the guy looks at the box and he's like, oh, it's like six quid. I felt bad. Yeah. Like, well, I, I think I, he I, said it. Six quid, is that okay? Well, yeah, yeah. She said, is that yeah. okay? And I was like, I, I felt sorry for the guy. Like, yeah. you know, and I was like, um, yeah, I'll just grab some else. Like, I thought, because I felt bad. I felt like I was stealing off him. Like, it was a whole yeah. box. Like, we were eating mushrooms for like four yeah. days in this house. Oh, like, yeah. We had loads, didn't we? We had loads at yours at the shop. And then I took some to my father. In law. I brought some home. And this guy only took six quid. And I thought, he's either really crap at maths, you know. But, no, but you, we, we say all that, and I have a co-op opposite me. So uh, quite a large co-op, <laughs> you know, convenience store. And their prices are outrageous. Yet they are yeah. grand. So yes. it's almost like, okay for some, not okay for others. You know, where they can dictate and, and push mm-hmm. it, they will. Uh, if that makes sense, it, make, it makes you it, it makes you wonder that consumers feel like they can pressure the veg guy into keeping prices keen, but they don't say anything at co-op because no one listens. Well, well no yeah, who's going to listen at co-op? Yeah. yeah, 
Yeah, who's going to live in a co-op? Yeah. No, definitely. So I want to jump into one of our first questions because, you know, why not? That's what we're here for. And um, so the question was, during lockdown, most chip shops, even the ones that never thought they would, were doing deliveries. Since lockdown, most hotels, pubs, restaurants, fast food chains have all begun to deliver. Would it be fair to say that just because the sectors are, I'm not going to use his wording, messed up for the, you know, temporarily, um, does that mean they have the right to saturate ours? And, and then on the flip side, he's saying, if it's fair play, can we now saturate theirs? You, you know. Okay. So what, yeah, what do you think of this? Like, right. So what I think, um, firstly. You know, you can do whatever you want as long as your planning allows it. You can't tell me that I can't sell whatever I want to sell as long as I'm allowed to by the law. And obviously the law now has been um, that they've allowed a few things to slip, haven't they? With pubs delivering and things. I don't think they're quite on it as they were before. No, no, no. I think that it's been allowed. It's not even it's allowed. Been allowed. So yeah, that, yeah. that's yeah. fine. So you can't uh, – I'll tell you a quick story about the kebab shop up the road. I started to do gyros a few years ago, which is a, a type of Greek kebab. And I had the first day that I launched it, I had a one-star review from the guy that owns the kebab shop saying, how can how can a fish and chip shop do kebabs? And just as I was reading the review, I looked up and he was walking past my shop. <laughs> and I went outside and I was quite polite. And I said to him, hey, listen, you can't do that. You know, I'm within my planning, I, I think... Uh, this was six years ago, I had to tell them what I'd have on my menu and I actually put it on there. It was a backup sort of plan, if you like. Um, so you can't tell an individual to to not do this or do that. It's the same way when some people comment on groups saying, oh, they're coming after. They're not coming after us. No one's coming after us. You can do what you want. We live in a, what? what's the word, uh, capitalist? Free you market. Know, a free market. We live in a free market. You can do what you want. If you want to, did did the did he, this chap say something about selling alcohol? Yeah, he said, what if we reversed it? And and, and well, some people do sell alcohol. So yeah. If you want to do it, do it. You know, yeah. you can't you can't say what someone else can do to pay their bills. So in in essence, I get the question, but I don't agree with his point of view. If that's am I understanding that? He thinks it's it's sort of a bit out of order that they're they're stepping on our toes in his mind. Would you yeah, say I that? that? I guess that and that's fair fair yeah. assumption. And, and well, I think for me, I think no one has a right to a monopoly, and and any mo- monopolistic sort of um, anything that creates a monopoly in a sector, in my view, it, I think it stifles innovation. Like you know. You know, if, if if I said, well, no one in no one in Bexhill is allowed to do fish and chips unless they had a license, for example, say, you know, and no one's allowed to do kebabs unless they've got a license, and mm. I don't know, it just stifles creativity, or you know, or like you said, no one's got a right to tell you how to earn money, like, and I think yeah, well, you're not breaking the law and you've got the right licenses, exactly. so so I don't know, I just think that in my view, if those shop owners that have spoken to this chap say, oh, we don't like the fact that pubs are doing whatever delivery and so on and so on. Well, I just think that, again, you've got to be great at what you do. Wait it out because at some point they're going to want to go back to being a pub anyway, which is really what they want. They don't want to be selling on delivery and just eat and all that. They just want to be a pub that sells food. You know, that's all they want to do. So they're only doing what they need to do to survive also. Um, So I think for me, you know, yeah. And if, if you were a fish and chip shop or a whatever, and you felt like a pub was encroaching on you. Well, if you want to do booze too, then do it again. Just make sure that you don't break any licensing laws and so on. I think that's yeah. right. I mean, I would go as far as saying that what does upset me about this, and this is not just fish and chip shops, all anyone delivering food, have they got the correct insurance? Yeah. Because it's not fair because we've delivered in the past and we're delivering again now. We've always done it correctly and by the law. And I would only say it should be fair for everyone because if it isn't, you know, we're we're talking a lot of money to get cars insured and we had a motorbike, you know, moped. And it's, you know, that's a lot of money. And if you're not doing it correctly, then I just, I don't agree with that. That upsets me. As you know, we've written a lot about this and spoke about it a lot. And I think, 
you know, we see it a lot in the groups and we've texted each other all the time and you're like, oh, there's no way that person's insured at that price. Oh, there's no way. Like, you know, um, and, and um, oh, I forgot the insurance called hiring reward insurance. Yeah. Sell, like no one's paying nine hundred, eight hundred pounds for hiring reward insurance. It's just impossible. Like, and then you'd ask the question in the groups and be like, oh, what insurance is that? And they just respond, business insurance, commercial yeah. insurance. And you're like, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa, you are not insured. And you know, the, the problem is, I don't know if, if people realize if, someone's working for you and haven't got the correct insurance and they kill someone delivering your food. Is it ca capital liability? Is that the yeah. correct term? I guess, I guess it will be commercial liability to some degree. Yeah. You're, you're in a lot of trouble yeah. and it's just not worth it in, in my view. So one of the companies that I see at the moment, they're doing a great job when it comes to delivery. And I think they've massively pivoted more so into delivery and it's, I think it's the fish and chicken group, Chesterford group. I think that, you know, they've, I think they said now they own over 50 cars. They're all owned by them. Um, they've got the staff that work for them. So the insurance ties in. And I think even they, they're probably big enough now to get insurance for like non-employed staff as well. So I think that, I think that once you start doing it properly, the costs just go up. And I think, you know, to say, oh, but I've got commercial insurance, that just doesn't cover it. It's a shame because there's um, there's insurers that basically insure people that work for Domino's, as an example, that you come on, you use your own vehicle. You, once you say your shift is five till nine, you're insured insure between five till nine on their insurance because you're delivering their food. Now, I've contacted these companies and they only allow big companies like dominoes i think amazon are on it other other things and that that's upsetting because them boys don't really need it we need well, it I th well but i think that those policies have been created for them because they've also got the backbone to pay for those excesses and i think because i know someone that rang up um is it very link or something a company called very link which is a company that we we, we sort of showed on one of our articles <clears throat> and they said like to have this sort of insurance it was going to cost for three cars about 10 grand a year i think you know right then there's like the idea of ability to throw on other cars and stuff like that and more drivers for that yeah. bracket but, see when so I, I contacted them I, I believe it was something like 30p an hour between yeah. uh, i think it was 20p and 40p an hour that's that's really good price <laughs> that's such a good price yeah but again you know, it's just such a messy field that if you can get someone else, sub it out and get someone else to cover it, then you get like taxes for argument's sake. Like that's yeah. the moment they as a dodo, aren't they? So Yeah, so that's what we're doing at the moment and, and it and it works. And I'm really happy. I'm really happy with the local company that we're using. And um for as long as we can we will continue in that vein. For as long as they'll do it, because it is quite a, a high percentage, I I'd say it's probably twenty five percent of my turnover at the moment so it's and i think it'll be more if we go back and we're we're still in tier four less people will come out so it'll probably increase that side yeah. but yeah, yeah you know for as far as the question goes i get where he's coming from i disagree with his point of view because it is a free market and you can't well, no, you, i i actually agree with his point of view to some degree and i explain why very quickly okay. Yeah, because it's a free market. If you want to retaliate in that manner, make sure you've got the licenses and go ahead. Yeah. Like, and that's it. Like, and, and uh, so I think for me, it's if you feel that strongly and you're that upset. Yeah, but don't do ahead. it just out of spite. Don't no, do no, no, it. Yeah, make, it, it, make, it fit, make it fit your business plan. Yeah, clearly. if it fits your business, but, go for it. Yeah, but if someone's already that upset, it's probably going to be out of spite anyway. Like, yeah, so that's know. the wrong reason to do anything. Next question. Very simple. Should consumers shop local? Now we discussed this one again a lot. Yeah. And we've all seen that. We've all seen that sort of um that shared post on, on the likes of Facebook and Twitter that says, Oh, when you buy a small business, you're helping you're not helping a CEO buy a third vacation home, you're helping a little girl get dance lessons. And I think I said to you ages ago, Well, well, you know, the CEO employs hundreds and hundreds of thousands of staff for argument's sake, you know, if we use Sainsbury's as an example, you know, so is it fair to then flip that on its head and say, well, if you don't shop at Sainsbury's, you're going to put them out of a job. Like, so my argument is I get where they're coming from. I get that, you know, but I don't know, like, I don't think we disagree, but I think we've probably got different takes on it. So what, what's your thoughts? Well, my thoughts, and firstly, I'll say I've been 
I sort of fell for this myself and and might have posted in the past something along these lines. I'm not 100% sure. I'd have to look back. Um, But it's a form of manipulation that I don't like, that you're trying to manipulate people to use you because you're local. Well, the person that works in... I get what they're saying. They don't want the the profits as such to go to a massive CEO. I get that. I understand that. But the point is... The same way if you come to me and buy fish and chips, my daughter goes to the ballet. Or if you go into Tesco's, well, Tesco's are paying that lady or that man and his or her daughter go to ballet. Well, it's the same thing. So I think it's a manipulation that I'm not that keen on now. And like I've said before, in the past, I probably would have fallen for this and maybe shared it and used it. Now, I, I don't really like this way, this this shop local. I noticed the other day I, I had to go to the shop to take the bins out. Uh, we're closed at the moment, obviously, for Christmas. And I know it's a lot of posters. Everyone but my shop actually had a shop local poster in. Um, and I just thought, you know, do I want to be part of that? What, what, other than, well, I don't even live in the town, so I'm not actually a local. <laughs> for one, spoon's not local. I, I didn't notice if they had a poster, but, you know, our products don't come from local. <laughs> Look, let's be honest about it. The shop, the the hairdresser's not next door. Well, all his products going to be made in China, probably the shampoos and all, all that stuff. Oh, that you know, shop what, with all the crap in it. I went in there. Yeah, yeah. where all that plastic crap is going to come from China. The point is, what's local? You know, uh, the people local, the people that work there local. I, I get, I get the sediment. I, I like it, but it's not something that I would personally use as a marketing tool. And that's just that's just my opinion on it. But every, you're free to do what you want, obviously. And a lot of people get behind this sort of thing. But there's loads of these buzz. Hashtag shop local. Hashtag, I don't know, you must know some. Some hashtag. Oh, sorry, there's loads. It's like, there's loads. I, mean, I, I get it. Like, I get it. Like, But I true that. Right, I'd say one. Right, so we, we've got where we are. We've got a Starbucks. We've got a Costa. And we've got loads of local coffee shops. Yeah. Every Friday, I like to try and meet a supplier locally. Yeah, you can't go to the local cafe at seven a.m., eight a.m. Well, they're not open. Like, so you have to go at like you have to then go to the chains. You know? Yeah, and 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 so is probably the coffee better at the local place. Probably, yeah. But I like to get, yeah. as you know, I, you know, I like to get. Well, it's questionable sometimes, but yeah, you, know, you know me, I like to get up really early, get my jobs done. You know, and and when you then go for a meeting with like the flower guy who is just the same as me, gets up really early. Um, it's just like, I feel, everyone's like, oh, why don't you shop local? Well, you know what? Like I would, but you're shut. Like you know, and and there's a computer shop in town, so I needed to go get a keyboard. Like. I look on Facebook. Yeah, it says it's open. Message him, says it's open. I get there, it was closed. So I messaged him later. I said, oh, you said you was open on Facebook and you messaged me back saying it was open. Yeah, well, I decided to finish early. See, that wouldn't happen at Curry's. It wouldn't happen at Comet back in the day, way back when. Like, you know, and and I think that's the point. Like, you know, I think for me, if I'm going to shop local, make it just as convenient. And I don't care if I spend a little bit more. That's not the, in, the that's not the injury for me. Like I, I, you know, I, you know, I gladly pay a bit more for like convenience. But you know, if they're making it harder for me and I've got to work around them, I just can't be bothered. It's too much effort. Like you know, that, that's my thought on it. So if you if you really want to compete on that level, I think come from a bold point of view, bend over backwards, and make sure you're always you know, always be selling almost or, you know, make it as easy as possible for that customer. But don't try guilt trip them into saying. I dislike that. I dislike that guilt trip. Now, in the past, I may have fallen for that and done done some things along the lines of uh, a frying ground nut. Uh, At the time, maybe five years ago, there was an article going around about Palm. I think I jumped behind it a little bit. In retrospect, I think I've deleted the post now. It's like a form of guilt and manipulating your customer like, come to us because of this reason. I think customers should just come to you because, you know, they like the food. They like the yeah. service. They like how they're treated. Not because you're giving me money and my daughter's going to go and have ballet lessons with it. Um, I'm not being funny. If they can't see that you're bloody local, something's wrong. It's a physical sight. Exactly. And all these other people that are working at these, these you know, big big stores, they're local too. No difference. Yeah. Local well, and, and I think it always makes me think of like the range conversation, you know, frying ranges. Yeah. And like, and, and a few times recently, people have said to me, "Oh, I bought this British range because it's British." 
I, you know, I'm supporting British industry. Yet, you know, when you talk to someone like Kremko, they employ 40 odd people. Yeah, I think that was the figure last. Like, so when you then talk to some of the English manufacturers, you're like, oh, how many people do you employ? Oh, 12. Yeah. So, like, who are you then helping if that's the case? Like, yeah. No, no, that's yeah. a really good point. That's a really good point. And, like, I don't know now, are Ford even built here? Is there any cars that are built in this country? Very yeah, there's few. loads of cars. No, there is loads of cars that are built Not in this loads. country. There's, a, there's few. But, but the point being, I remember years and years ago, you know, Fords and things, would you buy one only because, say you've got a Ford and a BMW, and they're similar price, let's say. What you know, some people are going to buy the Ford because it's built here, but yeah, there... but then many I think there's a few BMWs that are built over here, the well, or Mini that they're built over here. And you know, it's an interesting fact, actually. I wouldn't go to mention it because it's not on my notes, but we manufacture more vehicles today in the UK than what we did in our peak in the 70s, really. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. so you know, wow, that's, and, and, that's pretty cool. yeah, but you know, it's just that I think for me, it's just it's this whole I think there should be more to. You know, if you if your fish and chips were shit, mm. I wouldn't come in whether you were local or not. Like, yeah. because they're shit. Like, yeah. but if they're good, again, it for me it should be: is it good quality or not? And you yeah. know, is it great value for money? Is the service great? And if all of those things sort of fall into one for me, I'm, I'm shopping there. You know, put it put it this way, right? Let's say you've got a McDonald's, and then next to it you've got a Five Guys. Now we yeah. both know that. A Five Guys burger is better than a McDonald's burger. Most people would agree with that. Maybe not everyone, but most. Yeah? Yeah. And I'm not knocking McDonald's at all because I love them. Who's going to be the busiest? McDonald's. Every day of the week. Every day of the week. and But yet another person sells a, be- a, be- a better product. What? Why is that? Yeah. No, it's true. And I think it goes back to, like, you don't, you know, it's just the whole setup. It's value for money. It's good quality. It's volume. It's fast. Like, and I like Five Guys, and I, you know, I, I can't believe their shop fits. They, they must cost less than what it cost me to do my kitchen. Honestly, yeah. Like, yeah. but it's know. about what I'm saying. It is. It's not. Yeah. It's not always about the quality, though. You yeah. know, sometimes it's about the convenience. It's about knowing what you're getting. There's, one, there's there's a lot more in about I'd it. T- I'd say one of the biggest things that goes unspoken about sometimes in our industry massively and that's consistency and yeah. and and i think you know and i i just missed it a few seconds ago and i remember and it's just like you know it's one of the things that i preach about everywhere i go like consistency consistency like you know you know what's your oil management like what's this like what's that like and and i think mcdonald's are just mega good at consistency you know oh, but but yeah so but yeah, now you know why we've been, I'm not sure why we've been to McDonald's. I think we're it doesn't matter. About it, it doesn't matter because we, we've segued into what the next question is, which is why is McDonald's so busy? And like, so that was actually the next sort of okay. question. Right. So, what would you call that in the podcast world? Did we just do it's something? A segue, really cool? It's a segue. You know, it's no, I would say it was really cool. It's just that we sort of segued. So you know, <laughs> you know, I, yeah, I'm always in a McDonald's. Like, Pre lockdowns, I'm in there once or twice a week because they're everywhere. I can jump in, send a few emails, do a bit of work, you know. I like the coffee. I like the coffee. Cheap and cheerful, does the job. Cheap. It's yeah. I'm not I'm not knocking it. I, look, it's not the best food in the world. We all know that. Yeah. But it's at the right price. You know what you're gonna get. When it's yeah. good, it's good. The chips, them chips, come on, them fries, them right. French fries. When they're hot out of the fryer and really think- salt it well, that's a good fry. I add more salt. I get a little packet, add more. I know. Like, when they do it right, when they do it right, I, I just think, come on, that's a great fry. Yeah, it's you know what you're getting. It's not it's not amazing. No, but, but they're not charging you for amazing. Like exactly. Who said about the the ten years ago they had a ninety nine p burger and then well, I think 10 it was years. Fred on Fred on his podcast. Was Fred. Yeah. That was great and it's true. And that movie we've discussed this privately before. What a yeah. movie. The founder, mate. Honestly, yeah. like when, 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 when I've had it for ages, and I thought I couldn't be bothered to watch it if I'm honest. Like, and then everyone was saying, "Oh, it's really good. It's really good." So I watched yeah. it, and I've read the book, so I know what it's about. But yeah. I never thought I'd watch a movie about McDonald's and enjoy it. Like, never. Well, like, not only enjoy it, I've I've respected them for quite a few years now. Where I completely flipped on it. Years ago, if you'd asked me about McDonald's, I would have just said they're rubbish. When they are on it, they are really on it. You know, so I know the lady who's got quite a few McDonald's is around here. And 
McDonald's. And and yeah, they're, they're really into local working. Lo right. So this now helps us answer the question before as well, yeah. because everyone was, oh, it's a big chain. What are you doing helping those guys? Yet you drive down the road and you see their staff doing litter picking. You know, you know, you see that they sponsor football teams. You see yeah. that, you know. Oh, the we were sponsored, my school team, and I remember it. We were one of the first teams to be sponsored by McDonald's when that when they first did it. And we had the yellow shirts with the big, the big yeah. M, you know, the, the golden arches on it. And I, I might be able to dig a, a photo. And we were one of the first school football teams to ever be sponsored by them again it's the bit like the whole greg's thing we use them to bash all the time but mcdonald's have really innovated and and, and when you consider how much money these guys take like it's mind-blowing figures you know okay. and, it's amazing it's the, and we, we've discussed this so many times you want to see the future of anything look at mcdonald's yeah, because they're doing it, today, isn't it? Like, you know, one, one thing that a lot of people don't realise, again, because I go there quite a lot, you know, I go there now, I sit straight down. I don't even, like, go up to the machines no more. I go sit straight down. I've got the app. <clears throat> Within a few seconds, I've ordered what I've ordered, and it comes over. You know, yeah. and, and I don't think – and, again, we knock the staff at McDonald's generally as a society, yeah, but their staff are always really friendly, yeah. I know. You know, like, how are you today? How's it going? What can I get for you? Now, I know it's a bit American. I know it is, yeah. But... I think they dropped the have a nice day. They they did used to say that, didn't they? If I remember yeah, right, you were going. They're at the door, they say have a nice day. You yeah. know, but not being funny, so would I. So that's, you know what I mean? Like, but they're just... training. Though. Their training is on another level. They've got, yeah. they've got this lockdown. They've got this lockdown. I've spoken to a couple of people that used to work there and they've told me a few few bits and bobs and, and I love it. I love hearing about how they do things. It's we can learn we can learn a lot from them. We I really could. Proves, for me, what it proves about McDonald's, and it's what it goes back to our other question before and sort of ties up a few things, is that quality doesn't always matter. Now, they've got ethics. Many may not believe it, but they buy British. You know, um, I know for a few years they've been trialing um, um, organic. You know, their milk is organic. Their coffee is yeah. fair trade. You know, we may not believe is it, it, but they... Is know. it in Germany that I, Germany, I believe yeah. I've read somewhere that it's all organic? See, they're very yeah. what they're very clever at doing as well, because I heard in New Zealand that they actually use caged um, eggs because... Okay. It's a very deprived area where these McDonald's are, and, and that's what the people can afford. So they're very clever at adapting to their surroundings yeah, and absolutely. what the people will like in Germany. You're going to eat in a McDonald's. They're quite conscious. They're going to they're going to want it to be. It's going to need to be organic. A couple of points to back all that up is that I was reading a book by um, Ray Dalio, and he said it took three years for them to launch the Chicken McNugget, not because of the recipe, nothing like that. Purely because they were going to use that much, they needed to hedge all of the prices. So this guy, Ray Dahlia, with his investment group, they then said, well, look, if you guarantee the price of soya and feed and electricity and gas for the next five years, can can Tyson Foods, who's like the biggest chicken maker in the country, in, in the world maybe, can you guarantee this price for McDonald's for X? They were like, yeah, we can do that. So he facilitated that. You know, and then chatting to my friend, she says that they know the price of their nuggets for like five years. Like they've got five year prices. Yeah. So, you know, so makes you wonder like the volumes they go through. And again, it's all for consistency, you know, yeah. because they want people to go in time after time after time. You know, and, and, and another thing, like they said, like if McDonald's chose to go in the UK, if they chose to go free range, no, their chicken is free range, sorry. And it's all British. But if they chose to go, um, organic on the beef the they would need to plan three years ahead and if they did do it it would be unviable it just wouldn't be viable to produce non-organic beef because it would just flip the switch their volumes would be so great that it just wouldn't be worth farmers doing the opposite and and they've got that much draw that much power that they can really just flip the switch which is why they test things and do things properly and you know, and, and I give them credit for that. I really do. Oh, you've you know. got to give them credit for a lot. It's like their advertisement. They're, they're fantastic. I remember a few years ago they had, they were, so basically, uh, was it uh, Jamie Oliver when he was going on about the pink slime in, in nuggets? You know, it was a big thing. And obviously McDonald's listened to this and they brought out some adverts 
mocking themselves in a sense saying, you know, it's not made out of alien juice. I can't remember the exact words, but I sat there and I watched and I thought, wow, you know, they just put it all to bed, you know, and yeah. they're fantastic at that. Quite clever, isn't it? And you know, their normal beef patties literally just have beef and salt and pepper on. Yeah. Like, and yet nobody, if you ask anybody else about it, oh, but they're full of crap, but they're full of this, but they're full of that. It's but good. they're not, it's just beef. Yeah, nothing, no. Yeah. yeah. And I remember years ago, there was a video that I saw, a quick video, and um, Ray Kroc was walking out of an interview or something, and they said to him, oh, is it true that you put um, fishing worms in the burgers? And he turns around and goes, fishing worms cost triple the cost of beef. Like, yeah. would I? You know, and, and it's just those sort of things. like you know. But I do think, I think McDonald's have just done a great job keeping value for money. And I think that, you know, and, and consistency, I think for me, that's the big thing. And I think... I think that's yeah. the key to it. I believe where, and I'm to blame for this as well, where possibly our industry is heading in the wrong direction, potentially, yeah. with, uh, you know, oh, but our takeaway is so much better than other takeaways. Well, I don't agree with that at all. Yeah, you, you get quite annoyed about that, don't you? Like, you know, if you see someone like, oh, we're not like Chinese food, which is crap. Oh, we're not like yeah. Indian food. We don't know what's in it. And you're yeah. like, no, why, what makes us special? Like, yeah. yeah. Like, no, I don't agree with that at, at all. And I think this pushing the prices up, oh, charge for it, charge for it, charge for it. You know, we're always, you know, for the working class people, and we're, all, we're always value for money. And the way things have gone and, you know, it, it's so expensive. Like my my um, I think it's between seven and nine ounces. I do one size cod. It is a cod line. Um, and uh, I think it's 10 ounce, yeah, 10 ounce chips because we use the Hopkins scoop, you know, the ones that Burton Road made. And I think that's around seven pounds. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. If there's, you know, two adults, there's 14 pounds, say you buy a couple of sides, a couple of kids' meals, you know, 20, 25 quid you know, gone easily, you know, that's expensive. I think, I think, yeah, one of the things that we have been very clear lately about is just like, it's just when people say to me, oh, should I put up my prices? I'm just saying to them, think about it. Like, just wait, just, you know, can you hold out a little bit longer if you can, obviously? Yeah. Do you know what your margins are first? And I think, mm. you know, a lot of the time, if someone will ring me and they're like, I just think I'm too cheap. Well, are you? You know, figure out your margins first, because I think sometimes you might find waste elsewhere. Like, and I think, you know, yeah. Remember- the first thing you need to look at is definitely your waste, and you're hundred percent right. If you don't know your margins, you know what you're making gross profit on on any given item. Then Jesus, what are you doing? Mm. What are you doing? You need yeah. to know that. You need that is information. You think McDonald's leave anything to chance? You know, no, or, or any of the big guys, nothing. Everything's counted for. I think. I think. Yeah. One of the things that, again, like one. I remember. I think you might remember this because we might have been friends before, just slightly after this, or whatever. But I might have told you the story. I went to a shop, very busy fish and chip shop, and there was two guys cutting fish, and in between them they had. So there was two chopping boards. They're both cutting fish, and in between them they had a bin. Yeah, and this is a busy shop. We, it's not a quiet shop by any stretch of the imagination. And they're both cutting fish and they're just flicking the V's and they're flicking all the, the top bits and the side bits. And, well, you know, some of them are fish bites. And, and I was like, mm. so I'm looking where they're flicking it and it's a bin, a real bin. Mm. And so I'm like, oh, do you like, like, is it a clean bin? And like, you're just going to pick it all out later. And he goes, no, no, it's a rubbish bin. We, that's all going to the bin. And he was like telling me at the time, like at the time, fish was like ninety maybe at the time, like yeah, wow. it was a lot cheaper than that. Sorry, yeah. And mm. and like and you know, and I think maybe ninety felt like it was expensive. He was like, "We're not making our money off it." Like, and I think that was the inspiration behind the fish cake mix to some degree. Like, you know, I felt like we didn't have like you know how butchers have like mints and then they have sausage and then they have you know pie filling and stuff like that. We mm. didn't really have that in our industry. There was no outlet for it. Like and I think, and I think when I saw that, and I went back a few weeks later, and I presented the idea to them, and they've they've made homemade fish cake since, like, and you know, I think you, you get a second bite of the cherry, like, and you think, and again, yeah. I don't want to make this a plug, I don't want to make this a plug, like, it's not about that, but I know we joked about that earlier, obviously, but you know, it's not, it's genuinely not that. It's just that if you don't know what your margins are, you, you you're stuck, you're stuck. And- no, you you you're hundred percent right, and the fish cake mix is a perfect example of that that if you've got a product and then 
the waste of that product can be made into something that you make that's more money from. Jesus, why would you not do that? Stop, You'd stop have to be a waste. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, waste in the sense that if you weren't making the fish case, it's going yeah, to go it in the bin. Waste, yeah. and, you know. and I think for me, the biggest thing that I see and and is that a lot of people struggle with the gross profit. And I understand why, because there's a lot of factors that play into it. Do I, do I include oil? Do I include gas? Well, I always say, just keep it very simple, gross profit. If you want to throw packaging in there, that's fine. But just for the most part, but always just have a consistency. If you if you always do it that way, just always do it that way. And Mark Drummond and Fred Cape have really taught me a lot about margin. Like, you know, and I was... Yeah, Mark Drummond's uh, quite, oh, quite impressive know, with his... But he is, and I think, you know, if yeah. I was to text him now, he's probably in bed now, but if I was to text him for the most part and say, what was your margin this week, you know, like... Oh, yeah, definitely. And, and you know, for him, that's why he keeps a tight menu, he keeps a tight ship, and 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 I, I know it's hard, and I know it's hard to keep on top of all these things, but as we're going digital, these things are going to start presenting themselves. You know, yeah. you could just click a button and you know what your GP is at some point. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it's it's slightly harder in a fish and chip shop, especially with fish and especially with potatoes, you know, and, and peeling them yourself. The the wastage does change, obviously, as we know. Who's cutting it, you know, in, in big shops, you know, different people cutting it can cut it better or whatever. Uh, so it's a little bit harder. But, yeah, you've got to keep on top of that stuff. Yeah. You really do. So next one, do you think the pandemic has meant a reduction in the number of fish and chip shops that have off books turnover or share of books turnover for those that do it? In my view, to keep it simple without getting broiled into anything, well, of course it does. Any business that starts to go digital when it's been predominantly cash led, well, yeah, it does shine a light on dark things. So, yeah, I think it will be less. I think, yeah, that's my view, just to keep it really simple. Yeah, of course. Of course like, um I mean, I think we spoke about this years ago that there was people that were using Just Eat but given different bank account details. Now, I don't know how they were even thinking, how are you going to get away with that? I have no idea. For me personally, everything goes through my pre-o day. And when this is all over, if I can keep it like that and just do card payments, to be honest with you, I really would. It's so it simplified so many things to me. I don't have to go to the bank get changed. I don't have to count the till at the end of the night. And oh, it's short, you know. Ha- or, or what's the point in all of that when you can do it like this? Now I understand there's some people that maybe conspiracy led that don't want cash to go, and possibly they're right. I don't. I don't know. But for me, my business and the time it takes and the change I need, I would definitely keep just card only if I can. Yeah, definitely. So, as you may know, um, you may not know because I know you don't follow politics at all because I know what you're like. No. And every time I try and mention it, you're like, nah, don't want to know. So, yeah. <laughs> will Brexit be good for fish prices? Now, pre pre this week, so uh, you may not know, Nick, that the, the UK and the European Union reached a deal. Do you know that, Nick? Yeah, no, I do, I, I, I do follow a little bit of what's going on. Then. Yes, I do know that. <laughs> okay, so I'm just giving you the broad strokes here. I won't educate you completely, because well, I don't know either. But yeah, basically, please. my thought before this was that if we were to pay tariffs, then it would have been on European fish, which is mostly Spanish and German because they're the only ones that do frozen at sea, really. And then Iceland, Norway, Faroe, and all them lot have a different trade deal anyway. So we would have only paid a tariff there. However, now they have negotiated a, a zero tariff. So, yeah, now we're not going to pay tariffs from what we can tell in the initial writing. So what I would say is I don't know if that means that anything else changes. So why would fish prices fall? Um, the pandemic has probably dropped fish prices to some degree. Well, no, I'm not, I'm not seeing any fish prices going down, but uh, I don't know anything about the the politics of all this, but all I see is that if there's anything that can make suppliers have to put it up because of bumps in the road, then inevitably it will go up, whether that's intentionally to try and make more money. Not that I'm saying the suppliers will do that. Their suppliers obviously has to come somewhere. Yeah. And ultimately, if there's if there's excuses or reasons that it will go up, then it's going to go up, isn't it? And I mean, like everyone in the industry price, price of fish is crazy. You know, we know that I I remember you, you mentioned just a little while ago, 90 pound. 
I remember when it was that, and I remember when it crept over the hundred, and I was like, "What are we going to do?" I, I remember thinking, "How are we going to make any money?" And we are still making money. So people like to slate Mark Drummond, and, and obviously people that are not from the fish and chip industry won't know who Mark Drummond is. Yeah, but you know. But I remember Legend. when. Yeah, I remember when people were, were, were saying on on the groups that it was sixty five pound. Yeah? yeah, and they were complaining, and he said, "This ain't going to last for a long time." Like, you know, it isn't fair for fishermen to pay, you know, to get this sort of return on that investment. And I remember him calling it then and everyone was, oh, you, you're effing crazy. You don't know what you're on about. And and yet he was right. He's, you know, he was right that, you know, the, the fishermen were not going to tolerate it. Like, I'm not being funny. Why would you do one of the most dangerous occupations on the planet yeah, for that sort of minimal return? It just doesn't make sense to me, you know. No, nah, that, that's that's got to be one of the hardest jobs ever. Oh, no, I think I think fishing is up there with like oil rigs. They're like they're the, the top two like most dangerous yeah, jobs. I, you can do. I wouldn't fancy doing but, that. No, so and and I think what will be interesting is seeing what happens with British fish. You know, so for example, but with the that mostly go abroad anyway. No, no, no. But like, what I mean, like, he's like now with the common fisheries policy, they've made a few changes there, and in five years, um, I think the British fishermen will be able to catch a bit more in and the British waters. So we will get more north, you know, North Sea fish like had it. No, okay. yeah. yeah, I'm not on about southern fish, which probably does end up because yeah. Well, I guess all like fish. The oily stuff. We my, most of the oily fish goes abroad, doesn't it? Even our cuttlefish, yeah, but... which I think is a massive shame because obviously being near Hastings. I get cuttlefish when it's the season's right. And I think what a product, what a product that we're not, we're not using in this country. And I think uh, the supplier was telling me that, yeah, most of that goes, goes abroad. What a shame. It doesn't suit fish and chip businesses, but seafood businesses like, you know, yeah, I get that. Oh, I don't know. You, it's, you know, they can send it to you prepped and you can just batter it. It could yeah. suit us. It could suit us, mm. you know, Problem is, a lot of areas they just want their cotton chips, haddocken chips. Yeah, like, no, that, that, it could suit us in certain areas. Obviously, no doubt, yeah. it's not for all. Given re regional variations and preferences, if you were to open your own shop or perhaps a pop up, how would you, in exact detail, the one exact detail, make exact up your batter? And what would you do through the service to the batter? And how would you like your batter to look? So obviously, that question was framed at me, and I didn't really understand it initially, but you understood it better than me. So, Nick, how do you like your batter to look? And Firstly, I would say how I like my batter to look is spiky. Yeah. I, I like it spiky. I, I think one of the best-looking batters that I, I see social media-wise would be Whitby. Well, all of them are Whitby. Or no, sorry. When I say Whitby, you know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Magpie. <laughs> you know. Yeah, sorry, you know. That's the only one I really know, and it's the, it, for me their social media, you know, and the, the look of their their batter is impressive. I, that's what I like. Other people look at that and probably go, "Oh, what, why is it all spiky like that?" You know, it it won't it won't be to their eye. I love the look of that type of batter. Yeah. Uh, in detail, if I was to do a pop up and with regional variations, so obviously regional variations, I. I what I see on social media, the further north you go, usually the darker the batter. Would I be correct in saying yeah, that? The oil is more seasoned, I'd guess. Dripping, so it's going to be darker. Uh, so, look, if I was to do a pop up right here in the south, I'd, I'd like a spiky batter, no doubt. If it was going to be somewhere in London, maybe I'd incorporate a beer into it as well. You know, that could be interesting. And everything else would be how I make my batter now. It's weighed. I use cold liquid, I sieve the flour, I time it while I make it in the batter machine, I let it sit for 20 minutes before I touch it, I water it down to what I want, I keep it in, you know, in circulation for an hour and a half. If I'm not using it, it's in the fridge, and after that hour and a half has passed, it goes in the bin. Yeah. But this you shouldn't have to bin it because you're making too much, yeah. you know. Um, that's how I would do it. So one thing I think I like about, well, again, bat is probably my sort of thing, I guess. And I, I don't know who asked the question because I deleted all the names. Um, but I think for me, I like a spiky batter too, I think. But I, I, I don't, I don't, it doesn't have to be a lot of spikes. Um, I just like a bit of detail, a bit of texture. Um, I don't mind a smooth batter if it's cooked right either. 
I just don't like a thick batter that's doughy. I, I think there's nothing worse. I, I follow that. Um, Ah, oh, there's there's a chap that does uh he does like a fish and chip blog on Instagram and uh, I forgot his name now. Chip Diaries. Oh, chip Diaries. Oh, chip Diaries. Yeah. And yeah. He put a photo of the day and there was literally hardly any fish. And it was a tray full of thick doughy batter. You know what it looked like? It looked like the Chinese balls that you get without the chicken. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And I just yeah. thought to myself, that's just not appealing at all. You know, there's no excuse. It's lazy. Um, so for me, batter needs to be cooked all the way through, crispy. You know, and then, the, you know, a nice, you know, again, I don't want to plug anything, but the fish needs to be well seasoned. And I think that, you know, or the batter needs to be well seasoned. Take your pick, you know. No, the season, I would definitely go with the, the seasoned flour and not plugging you because I'm not here to do that, obviously. As you know, I use it. And the problem is with seasoning the, the, the batter itself, that can break down your oil quicker. I mean, yeah. I think that's pretty proven, no? Yeah, I not guess it is. No, I guess it is, yeah. Um, so I, would, I would definitely season the, the flour as, as the product I use does because, yeah, seasoning is really important. One thing I want to add, one thing I specifically hate, and the, and the question that he'd ask for, like, specifics. So one thing I really do hate is overbeaten batter. It does my head in. You know, but why would you not time it? Why would you like? Me, why I'm, would you not have a batter machine? And why would you not time it? Would I, be. I'm not a big fan of batter machines. So I don't know if I've told you that before. Nah, right? Yeah. Nah, so, I, I'm all day with the batter machine. Yeah, but I just think that it's the opposite reaction. So for me, like from a technical point of view, when you make batter by hand, you introduce air. Yeah. When you okay. use a batter ma machine, it takes air out. Yeah, because it's a very but different. Then, then, isn't the argument, you know, we do it for 50 seconds, so yeah. 30 seconds for the batter in, 20 seconds to stop. And then obviously with when we water it down, mm. we want to get the air bubbles in it. So and we're introducing yeah. the air at that time. Another thing I do, and again, I think it might be a bit strange for people, is I don't overmix it. Like, literally, if I was using a batter machine, it'd be 30 seconds from the last scoop, yeah? And then if I'm doing it by hand, I always leave lumps as well. Like, and everyone looks at me a bit crazy. Like, oh, yeah. You know, Nothing wrong with the lump because then yeah. they they become crispy. Obviously, yeah. not too many, but yeah, yeah they, you, that's they, another texture thing. Because fish and chips can be quite the same texture. You know, you're having chips, then you're having something battered. Obviously, yeah. you have got the fish, the softness, but it is very similar textures. So it's nice to have that something yeah. different. And and what 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 is your preference? Um, just quickly, just don't don't worry about it too much. But blanching chips versus straight cooked chips. Well, for me, I'm a blancher where we are, we sort of, uh, it's what most do. I like a, a straight cooked chip too. And if you're, you, if you're in the north, I, I, suppose. Well, I don't even think it's a north thing. Like, I, I, I tell you what, though, um, some of the best chips I've ever had that have been cooked straight through were at Burton Road Chippy. You, you, you like, you wouldn't even know. Like, and I, I was well, like, that's oh. north, isn't it? Well, yeah, I guess it is, but, you know, people around there still blanch as well. But well, I don't think there is a north-south div divide when it comes to blanching, I don't think. Um, no. But, no I'm, I don't know what I've seen from social media. Yeah, it seems there is a divide. Well, maybe. I don't know. I've never noticed it. But but I do think, you know, you can get some real good cooked chips sometimes. Like, and you think, well, they're good. Like, you know, but no, for me, I'm more of a blanched eater. I do like a blanched chip. And like, yeah. when, I, when I've been at yours and had that burger that time, and, you know, when you're doing the burgers and had those chips, it's just like, <sighs> like. Remember them chips uh, that I froze and then we did? That the remember them? That time for, like, I don't know, like once I had chips there and it was just like, I remember sending a photo to Fred and he was like, they look good. I was like, they were good. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. but um, yeah, no, I think, you know, you mess around with stuff and I like that. So to be fair. So, you know, Next question. What marketing strategies for the typical takeout shop have you seen that have been really successful? Okay, well, I mean, if you're going to be talking successful marketing, come on, you've got to be talking Simpsons. Are they not the the leaders in that that department? Uh, more, you know, were, they still are, but more now, I love what Millers do. Yeah. I love the, the look of their social media. Is it is it Nick? I think I met him yeah, once before. Nick, yeah. Seems like a cool guy, and uh, I love what they do. I mean, yeah, they push it. They push it. And Simpsons. And what's, there's so many, though. There's too many to mention. They're just the two that I can think about right now. Yeah. And I think I, I, I do, you know, I, I think 
well, there is two camps here. You can use a marketing company or you don't have to. And I think well, one thing I always say to people is, you know, if you've got three, four hundred, five hundred a month, you're scratching the surface, even at five hundred pound a month. Like, you know, you, you need to spend a fair bit and have your own ideas as well. But I think I would just do it myself. You've got an iPhone or an Android phone, like get some great yeah. photos. You know, yeah, harder, you can. Yeah, you you can do it yourself, but it depends. Now, if you're going to open a shop that's got a hundred seat restaurant and you're really trying to push it with loads of staff, and I don't think you could take that on as well as trying yeah. to run that place. You okay. would need someone. It depends what type of shop you're talking now. Again, if you've got an outlet with a hundred covers, I guess you probably, or I hope you have, got some budget to do stuff like yeah. that. But I know, think you need to. Yeah, if, you've got, to. if you've got a small takeaway, you open 20 hours a week, you, you could argue there's probably a bit of room there as well. Like, again, every, it's, you know, and how, how competent people are. You know, you know, you do a good job, I think, for the most part. Oh, well, you I know, don't know about that. No, the food always looks good, the photos that you take. But then my, my question was, I wanted to throw a question at you, actually. Um, and it's sort of the same thing. Do you find that when you take a nice photo with it for Instagram, social media and so on, can it be a bit of a headache because it sets like a fake expectation to customers? It's like almost like the McDonald's effect, isn't it? Like, oh, look how great okay. that looks. Then you get it and it's a bit sweaty or whatever. Like, yeah. Well, I can, I can tell you a good story about that. Firstly, I think if I 99% of everything that I've ever posted photo-wise of food is on the fly. We're cooking it and that's about to go to a customer because that's how I like to do it. And out of 10 pieces of cod that I cook or when someone worked for me cooked, I'd see one of them and go, I want to take a photo of that. And then out of them, you know, maybe only one out of another 10 photos would actually make the social media page. You know when you're taking a good, a good photo. Well, a few years ago when we used to do burgers, I, would, I made this burger and it just looked, it looked wicked. So I took a photo of it. We got quiet. I put it on uh, Instagram or, or Facebook. I can't remember both probably. And uh, a few hours later, we had a message uh, comment from a guy who hadn't actually eaten that burger, was a customer, doesn't come that often. He, you know, said it in the comment. He was like, I can't believe you're doing what McDonald's do, make your food look better than it than it really is and all this. And at the same time saying, your burgers are brilliant, by the way. And uh, I, re- I just replied politely and just said, well, that, that was a photo of a burger that was about to wrap. And obviously, once I put it in a wax-coated wrap, put it in a bio box, the, the staff put it in a bag and it's gone out for delivery or whatever. Yeah, it's not going to exactly look like that, is it? Let's be honest. But that was the, the burger I made for someone that, that evening. And, uh, yeah, he just went off on one. And to be honest, yeah, there, there's no doubt. But what are you going to do? Take a picture of something you don't like the look of and put that on your social media? What are you, what are you meant to do? Come on. <laughs> the best one is ever. I love this one, actually. It's a stupid thing, but it, it just latched on. I couldn't have planned it if I tried. But do you remember when you got that, the butterer? Yeah. Oh god, that was yeah. brilliant. Yeah. So you and I did it in reverse. And you did it did in, it in reverse. reverse. And I then posted on Instagram. I said on Instagram, "Oh, so it takes butter off." And people yeah. were complaining, saying that you were being yeah. stingy and taking butter off the buns. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I got, I got quite a few. I was so proud of that little. I ordered that from America because I'd seen it on Instagram that you keep it on the, the your, your burger grill and then you just you yeah. know get the butter on your your bun and then it toasts better. I was so proud of it. I posted that in the reverse. Obviously, who it, takes sorry. butter off rolls? Who takes yeah, butter that, off that, rolls? And that's what made me laugh so much because it was just a stupid comment and yet people believe that you were taking butter off rolls. Oh, and I think yeah, that is the that, problem with social media. It just dumb things down a little bit. But, yeah, I think... Uh, no, I do agree with your choices there. Miller's, you know, Simpsons. Simpsons were ahead of the game. Um, obviously, yeah, Simpsons yeah. is a marketing company. Um, and then Miller's don't. And But again, Nick is very, very good at that. Um, yeah. Very good at that, as you know. Um, so, yeah, I think um, I, I, I know someone recently that took on a marketing company. He's paying 300, 400 pound a month and he doesn't have a clue of where to start. And you know what? Unfortunately, nor will the marketing company. If you don't have an idea of yourself, of what it takes or what you're doing, then it's going to be hard and it's going to be hard for the marketing company. They can't make your ethics. And that's the difference. The likes of Millers and Simpsons and, you know, a lot of these people, they have their ethics. They know what they're doing. They know their plan. 
So yeah. I, I think before you start looking at stuff like that, know what it is that you are, if that makes sense. Yeah. And um, what you want to look like as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, <clears throat> what do you want people to perceive you as? Because, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, my social media is, is quite mixed up. In it, uh, you know, you try to get a message out, oh, that didn't really come out right. And I think to myself, they've taken that wrong. Or, you know, I, I've posted stuff and deleted probably just as much as I've posted. Yeah. Going back, on it, I don't like how that came out. I didn't like how that sounded. Not not even talking about the photos. And I think you're right. You can put yourself in a corner posting great photos of yeah. people's expectations. Not that that isn't the food. That is the food. It's not all the food, mm. obviously. Um, it's probably better for someone like a scallop shell, for argument's sake, because yeah. he's a restaurant. And if yeah. he takes a photo of a flat lay of all the food on the table, well, that's how it's going to come for the most part. Yes. Yeah. That's how, yeah. yeah. It's I'd... not had to do that final mile, had it? You know, gone in a bio yeah. box or whatever. And yeah. that's a really, that's a really good point. And yeah, good shout out for them. Cause they are, that's a page that I look at. I'm not embarrassed to say it. And I look at it and I think, wow. Yeah. That's, uh, that's so cool. It is one of the few pages that I look at and I do feel hungry. Like looking, yeah. At, well, I just know. want to go and eat. There's, I, I was, I tell you a story actually. You probably don't know this, um, or you probably do actually. I was actually their first customer in the one in Bath in yeah. the uh, the takeaway. I've got gone to Bath with my wife. Uh, we just had Athena, she was she was under one. We had we were still still lived in Wiltshire at the time, and uh, yeah, I was one of one of his first customers. Not, not that I sure. know him personally or anything like that. To be fair, Gary, good, did, I had the journal on. Gary did mention it. And he said he'd never seen anybody put back that many carbs ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just had the Gernard and chips. Uh, that's all that. And the peas. And Four the peas. times. <laughs> yeah. Time late. No, it, it was lovely. I never managed to get to the restaurant, though, because I think we moved quite quickly after that. But yeah. I'd been to his shop and the farm as well, and it was amazing too. Yeah, nice. So next question. Aggregators are growing at an extremely fast rate. Do you think businesses – should use these or risk being left behind it's essential for more, most sellers in other industries to be on ebay or amazon do we think food should will be any difference go on nick you go first well that's a great question to be honest and i've never really looked at it in in that way now i've got experience with aggregators because i was with just eat for i believe it was close to three years um so where do i start with this one i think there's pros and cons to both. For me, being that I was with them and now I've got my own thing, well, a pre day thing, which I rate highly, uh, I would never go back to an aggregator. I would never use a Just Eat. Uh, it's, it's, there's so many, you know, bad points to it that I saw firsthand. I'll give you an example. Friday night, 6 o'clock, you know what it's like. And I'd have 20 tickets come through. You can only add a certain amount of time onto them. You know, an hour is your standard time. You add the extra half an hour. Now, <clears throat> this was a few years ago, so it may have changed. So I'd add an hour and a half. Well, how many hour and a half can you keep adding? You know, the tickets are piling up. And uh, they do it in a 24-hour clock. So a customer's got the reply. I've accepted the order. It was, say, half past six. So they've got the... It will be with them at twenty zero zero. Obviously, the twenty hour clock, hour and a half, eight o'clock. Well, half an hour later, she calls up. Where's my order? It said it was going to be twenty minutes. <laughs> to be honest, I probably did chuckle, which might not have been the right thing. Uh, you know, explain to her the system. Oh yeah, well you're accountable. I said, well, no, I'm not accountable. Actually, this isn't my system. I didn't design the system. You know, yeah, I'm doing my best with within the system that they've designed, but it, it's, it's flawed. It's so flawed. And no, I don't think it is. Just flawed. It, I don't, I don't, I don't want to interrupt you there. I don't think it's flawed. It's geared perfectly for just eat. The fact for, that, for them to get the maximum. Yeah, I get, I know. What you're they saying, yeah. They don't, they don't care about your bottlenecks. That's your problem. Yeah. If you can't do it, there's 10 of the chip shops or curry shops or yeah. uh, outlets of whatever that can do it. You know, for yeah. them, it's, you know, you, if they give you time slots, well, now you're saying, well, you're bottlenecking them and they don't want to be bottlenecked because that's yeah. really, they could be making off you, you know? Yeah. So in my view, no, you're right. 
Yeah. Yeah. You're you're hundred percent right. You know, I I just found them a really difficult company to work what for, about, and I did work from. I don't know if they still do it, but do you remember the time when they called you and they were like acting like a customer, and then you do the one. Oh no, they did that. Yeah, they did that. Um, so it would usually be uh, someone calling the shop. Uh, the number would come up, and I, I one four seven one day because I said to her, I was like, uh, "Look, I know, I know it's just the I'm really busy at the moment. I, I I can't talk about this. No, this isn't just the I'm a customer. Okay, so then I one four seven one day because they were so silly. They didn't even uh, you know block their number, and then it would ring and it'd be like, "Yeah, hi, just the you know the the automated message." I was like, "What are they doing? Well, that was a big reason I left them actually because that really bothered me." Uh, at the time, what what you have to realise, and I don't know if it's changed now, their policy was you had to have the same prices in store as online. Now, most people will know this now. You can't do that. Yeah, I'm sorry to say, you you just can't do it. There's more costs involved. Where does that where does that come from? If you're making fifteen percent net profit at the end of the day, and it's costing you fifteen percent or seventeen percent just eat, well, you're losing two percent. Well. What's the point of being in business? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I, I remember one, one of the things that always I found quite profound that you used to say is that where they call you like a partner and you log into the partner center, you felt like they yeah. were genuinely your partner because of the fees that were yeah. getting. Well, I felt like I worked for them. Yeah. I worked for them. And their fees, yeah, we, we wasted a lot of money. And at the time, something like Prio Day didn't exist. You know, thank God it does now. Not that Prio Day isn't without its faults as well. You know, it's not the it's not the perfect system but my god is it better than than going with someone like justy or or any of the other ones so yeah what, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan one of the things that really i, th- I think that makes me wonder is that like, if people want to use the aggregators that's fine obviously make it work to your business you know your margins yeah. and everything but then when you start using their packaging because it's cheaper and then you start mm. getting their bags because they you know their delivery bags yeah. because they're cheaper and then you put it on your car because they gave you a deal to put it on your car and it's just like well you've given away your brand and are you at risk of becoming a wholesale food supplier to the likes of just eat you know and then i think the other thing that really you know again you know me i look at business plans a lot and i, I i'm a bit anal about stuff like that but who owns the customer you or just eat and oh just eat yeah. We it got to a stage near the end where you didn't even have their phone number. You have to call Just Eat, give them a code that's on the ticket. Then they call the customer. You can even call the customer to say, like, you know, whatever. Like it's running late, or where are you because the address was incorrect. Nothing. You had to go through Just Eat. You know, they they are very smart with it. You can't knock them. You can't knock them. Uh, very smart company that make a lot of money. Wow. Now the question is though, do we need it? That, oh, now, that's a really good question. I, I don't think you you don't need it anymore. However, it will be harder doing it the other way. There is no doubt. You know, uh, just the will switch on, you know, a certain algorithm to make sure that you get a few customers when you first start. Mm. But then sooner or later, it's going to be like, you know, oh, well, if you want to do this, you've got to do this. And if you want to do that, you've got to do yeah. that. And- yeah, well, that's. I, I I saw that at first. Um, it went on reviews. So however however many reviews you had and how good they were, not the volume. It was how good they were. That's how high up the page you were. Well, they soon changed that, and I think they actually. I, I'm not sure if they charge for it or there's some not a scam, but there's some way they make more money out of it. You being higher up now, well, I guess and the, I saw the change of things happening like that. Well, I guess you could be a sponsored post, just like you're doing whatever Amazon or yeah, uh, just yeah. And, you know, it was the supermarkets that invented that back in the day. If you wanted the corner slot, you pay for it, you know. Yeah. So, um, next question. I don't want to get into whole the old aggregator thing. Look, to be fair, we wrote about it. You know, it's there for people to see. You know, yeah, we know what. It, it's yeah. a great question. It's a it's yeah. a great question. I. I I don't think you need them, but that's just my opinion. Yeah. Why do you think hospitality and fish and chips in particular struggle with employing and retaining staff so much? How do you see the solution to this problem? <clears throat> so I think 
wider hospitality depends which fields, but for the most part, I think they do all right. Um, I think that some people still wouldn't mind working in a nice restaurant. Um, depends what type of restaurant. Um, I do think the fish and chip industry has probably, uh, th- when it comes to staff, unfortunately, I think like we're scraping the barrel. Like I think, and I think, and I do think there is because I've always said this. McDonald's again, again, I don't want to this don't want to be a McDonald's podcast, but if you're giving 16 year olds six pound an hour and they don't have to think on shift and it's very flexible and they can work it around their college life and whatever their social life, you know, why would you go work somewhere where you have to think and you have to learn and you have to do things and you're probably not going to get six pound an hour? You know, and then if you're older, let's say you're 21 or whatever, and let's say you know, let's say you're 18, you go to the co-op or the Audi and get eight fifty nine pound an hour for stacking shelves. So the, the market for wages, you know, it's it's really competitive now. Like, you know, so you know, just saying to someone, "Oh, come work for me for six fifty an hour," I just, I, you know, what sort of person are you going to get for a start if they can't get any of those other jobs? You know, so. And I do think it is money. I think money is always the first hurdle. Why do people go to work? Because of money. You know, would many people go to work if they didn't need money? Like, no. So so I do think the, one of the first hurdles for me is money. And I think I think that's the way to fix it. And I know it's hard. Um, you know, I think one of the lads I know who's got a chip shop says that he knows a lot of lads that he would consider for frying jobs can go work on a building site and get 150, 180 a day. So, you know, and then hospitality is mostly shit hours because you're working when people are enjoying themselves. Um, and, and I think if we look at fish and chips in particular, it's a sideways career trajectory. You, know, you own one shop, Nick. No one's going to overstep you, are they? You'd probably give it them if they could, you know. <laughs> so, you know, so you know. And then if you work for someone, I guess like fish and chicken. Yes, there is some upward mobility there, you know. But I think, you know, if you're working for a chain, I can see where there's upward mobility. But if you're working for an independent, which the majority of our industry is, how far are you going to take it? You know. So, I I don't know what your thoughts are there, mate. Sorry to like butt well, into all that. No, no. no. I think what you said at the end, uh, I've been to a few shops that that they have multiple sites and they seem to, and not just multiple sites within fish and chips, they may own two kebab shops, a calf, a fish and chip shop. And they, they always seem to, to hire the people and offer them a percentage because, like you said, most people are money motivated because that's why we work. Now... I hire the the team I've got at the moment are uh, three college college students. Um, I pay them a lot more than minimum wage. I look after them as best I can, but they come and go. That that's what they do in our industry, and I think the sooner we realise that, the better off we'll be. Not many people are coming into our industry and sticking at it because there's far more shops like mine where it's just you know a one man band sort of thing than multiple sites. Um, and you're not going to attract people that are going to come from the age of 16 and stay with you till they retire. No. It just doesn't happen in our industry. So I think the quicker we can realise we're going to have a high turnover. How do we teach these these kids to learn the job as quick as they can so, and then so pay, pay them as well as we can? So in your, in your sense of the word, it's passive employment. We know they're going to be with us two years max while they're at college, yeah. uni or whatever. You know, yeah. be, be a flexible employer, bend over backwards where we can. And, yeah, make the training as easy as possible so it doesn't cost as yeah. much, you know. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the, the best we can do. I think I think they need to stop looking into how can we make people come into our industry and stay there. So I just don't think that's ever really going to happen. Yeah. I think one, of, one of the other things is like, for me, it's management skills. You know, most people are self-employed. If they haven't done another job before, you know, it, it, you know, it, you're sort of dealing with different people at the best of times and, you know, then younger people are harder to manage. So I think I've always sort of tried, you know, back in the day when I worked in, the, you know, in the fish and chip shops, I treated all staff like they were volunteers, like, and, and it, it sounds crazy, but I treated them like they could work anywhere. I, I got rid of, I've dispelled this myth straight away that they couldn't get a job anywhere because everyone can get a job somewhere else. Like you don't own them, like, you know, and, and I think the minute you treat them like you want them there and, 
you know, I think I saw a post on one of the groups of the week and it said, I can't believe it. I've been cutting fish all day. My staff member came in and didn't make me a cup of tea. And I was thinking, well, th th that's not their job. Where did it say that in your, you know, their employment is that they must come in and make you a cup of tea? Like, you know. I've got, I've got to say sometimes, uh, currently I haven't got the Facebook app on my phone, as you well know, <laughs> come in and out of it because I can't read comments like that. Yeah. That's just, that's just pure stupidity. Yeah. And people posting stuff like that. Um, is the reason that I can't have the app on my phone because I just go on and get pissed off. And then I'm like, I can't be dealing with that. I, th I think, you know, exactly like you said, you don't own them. They can get jobs at most places. Let's be honest about it. Our job is is harder on your feet. Yeah, you, You're dealing with customers. Um, you know, it's horrible hours. The hours are horrible. You know, there's so many more jobs people can get that. The, the, like exactly like you said, building work. I'm, only, I'm, not, yeah, I'm not being funny though. If you did have to work nights, let's say you worked. At, I, I think I told you about, it, didn't I? If you work at the UPS, you get like 15, 16 quid an hour working a night. Yeah, exactly. So you're not dealing with exactly. customers that are doing your editing either. You know, and you're just no. moving boxes around. No. You know. No. I think the, the quicker we we realise that you're not going to get many people to stick in there. Apprentice, you know, all this thing about having apprentice uh, people come in. I, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think that's going to work. I, think, I, I just think there's I mean, always going to be. There is a place for that. And I think if someone wants there's to... There's a place for it, but it's, it's a very small percentage. Well, I think the other thing is... That, that, no, no, I get it. But that type of person that is going to be the apprentice, you better make them a partner or they're going to be doing their own thing in a few years' time if they can save enough. Exactly. Money. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's someone with that exactly. sort of motivation... It, it, you know, if someone is that motivated to get stuck in our industry and they want to make their way through the ranks, then they want to own a piece of it. Some, you know, at some point, in my view, yeah, yeah. Of, of, of course. I mean, I, 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 um, as well as working for my parents, I worked one day a week for a, a lovely lady in Wiltshire that owned a, a busy fish and chip shop, a really busy one. And um, before I left Wiltshire to to move back here to open my own shop, you know, she offered me like a percentage, you know, of the profits and a really good pay. In retrospect, I should have stayed and taken that. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, that's how you get good people. Yeah. And if you've got a really busy shop, sometimes you have to give them something to keep them. And if you find someone that's really good and is going to care for your business like it's theirs, then uh, you may have to cough up Yeah. if you want to keep them. Next question, Nick, and I, I want to throw this one straight to you because this is your sort of forte as a, a Florigo sort of trainer on the side. I'd like to know if filtering the pans with my Florigo filter system is enough to do 100% gluten-free the next day. Uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying it's 100%. I wouldn't feel comfortable saying anything is 100% gluten-free. Uh, as far as I've understood it, if the sump drawer is cleaned out and it's a new pad, once you filtered, if you were to test that, oh, apparently it's one part per six million, uh, you'd know better than me still. I think that, that would be classed as gluten-free, wouldn't it? I think it's one part per one million. Yeah, uh, the, the terminology, yeah. A, a, anything un, so anything under 20 parts per million is now classed as gluten-free. But I think that there was some talk about changing the terminology to very low gluten at some point. I'm not sure. Yeah, how, I'm not sure how that's all. I don't know how that's going to work, but I completely agree with you. Uh, so back to that question: nothing's 100 percent gluten free. That is what I've been told, um, but I wouldn't feel ever comfortable saying that it's 100 percent gluten free. Yeah, I think the, the, the EHOs are getting pretty hot on this now, especially with the Pretamonger, uh, you know, um, allergen things. And I think we mentioned yeah. we mentioned that chap somewhere at an Indian restaurant and. So yeah, I think it was in York that yeah. killed someone, yeah. yeah. So I think EHOs are getting really hot on it. I, I'm not sure if I told you about my brother. He um he always sieves his flour like you do, his yeah. batter flour. And he was sieving his batter flour, and the EHO says to him, oh, you know, you should put a sign up saying that your food's not suitable for celiacs. And he goes, but I don't do gluten-free. And he doesn't. And they're like, yeah, but you should still put a sign up saying it's not suitable for celiacs because there's going to be um, wheat in the air. And he was like, but I don't, I, you know, he argued it. And he goes, but I don't sell anything for celiacs. I don't say my chips are for celiacs. And he doesn't, nowhere, like, you know. And she was like, well, I think you should. I mean, he was just like, no, I'm not going to do it. But then. No, that's crazy. That's but, crazy. But then it is and it isn't. Like, and, and it, but I, I do think it's like, there's no common sense anymore. A friend of mine owns a baker's and a mum went in who wasn't a celiac. And her kid was 
not allergic. Oh, what's the word that's worse than allergic? No, allergic's the worst one. No, intolerance the easiest one, but yeah, you know, in the scale of things. But then um allergy is worse. So she takes a little yeah. boy in who's got an allergy to gluten and he's just standing there waiting to order bread. She goes home, he gets ill, very ill. And then she rings up the bakers saying, you made my kid ill. And she goes, why did he eat bread? Because, you know, the allergens are on the label. She goes, no, from the, the air in the shop. He goes, well, it's a baker's. What do you expect? Like, you know, like, and, and he goes, if you knew your kid was that bad, like, you should have made him wait outside, you know. <clears throat> yeah, we, we've, we've had that in the past where a lady left a, a comment saying that we'd made her kid ill. And I, I commented back to her privately and just said, oh, I'm really sorry, uh, what was this? And she's, she said that we didn't change our oil or something. And I do change that oil every time I do, you know, how I do it is I take the oil out of the fish pan that I'm going to fry the gluten free in, put that in my tabletops to fry my scampi and things of that night and put new oil in. So she was wrong. She goes, Oh, my kids, you know, super sensitive and stuff. And I, I said to her, well, you know, if you had called me and I get many calls about this, if they say to me, my kid or I am very sensitive, what do you think? I say, no, don't risk it. And especially if it's a child, yeah. especially if it's a child. Yeah. My daughter is gluten intolerant, and that's what led me to do the gluten free. Um, to be honest with you, I think if you're going to do it, you've got to do it properly and change your oils. But in all fairness, I would have thought one day, hopefully, you're going to make a batter. Not that the gluten free batter isn't great, it's amazing but one that's closer to a normal batter and then everything can be gluten-free. Yeah, I think, but you know, gluten-free products are just so much harder to work with because gluten actually has a function in the technical. Yeah, area. yeah, no, they are. Yeah, the, the gluten-free batter, as good as it is, and it's by far the best on the market, and I tried others, I won't mention names because I'll probably get a phone call. <laughs> again. <laughs> but again, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a different beast. It's very different. Yeah, and uh, yeah, but I don't. It's weird because I don't know. I just think for me, like if you're that sensitive, stay home. Like, yeah. don't really. don't put yeah, don't put it on on someone. Don't put that yeah. responsibility on me. It's like that with uh, you know when, like I said, when I get these phone calls. Oh, oh. can you guarantee it? I'm like you can't guarantee nothing. Look, I'm not guaranteeing nothing. Yeah, but if we flip the question, you as a parent, you wouldn't put it on someone else, would you? No, no, never. I would never. I remember uh, I took Athena last summer, the summer before. Might have been last summer. I can't remember now. Uh, my wife was working, so I had her at the shop. She she helped me prep. And then after lunch, I took her down to the seafront for an ice cream in Bex Hill. And I just said to she wanted a chocolate ice cream in a tub, so no cone. I said, is there any gluten in there? She, he goes, I can't guarantee it. I said, can I just see the ingredients then? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I just need to know if there's any gluten in it. And he was, he didn't really understand. He finally brought me the thing with the ingredients and there wasn't any, but I had to check, you know, I couldn't take, he said, oh, well, there's no, no, I don't think there's any in it. You need to, I need, you need to know, Yeah, you know, is yeah. my point. No, definitely. So next question, um, innovate or die is something always part of my thinking. Not me. This is the questioner. What is Sarah's biggest innovation this year? And I said to her, it feels like a plug, but I do know who, who sent this question. So, um, but I don't think we've only innovated one thing. I think this year um, we've, we've launched a few products, but I wouldn't say we've innovated lots. Um, and I think the biggest innovation is our pan cleaner. I think, you know, the super absorbent cloths and the potato preparation, they're not innovations as you know, um, I, I'm yeah. clear about that. Great product. Though. Yeah, no, they are. Great product. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, you know, I'm very honest about what it is. I'm not going to, you know, you know, bring out the new wheel that's round. Do you know what I mean? Like, but no, yeah. the pan cleaner, as you know, is brand new because you know, and we, you know, we did de develop that a lot. And, and I remember, I was laughing earlier when we were talking about this because, um, do you remember when I rang you and I was like, oh, like I've been working on this, and you were like, yeah, and I was like, well, <laughs> I knew it. I knew where it was leading to. I knew it, <laughs> and I was like, I'll come down. I'll even clean your pants, and you were like. Well, they do need a clean, but will my pants break? And I was like, and I think I just sort of said, well, if they do, I'll buy you new ones. And I was like, yeah. and that was a bit of a that's bold. Five grand a pan. And, and to be fair, that is a bold claim because that's three times that five is. grand. Like, and I think, you know, four. Oh, four, sorry. Yeah, four. So that's 20 grand. And I remember, 
and you were laughing because um, your spider broke, didn't it? Your lifter, your chip lifter or whatever it was, your fish. Yeah. Broke. And at the bottom where the filter hole was, I saw a hole down there. And I was like, Nick, Nick, you better get in right now. Because I thought it was a split in the pan. <laughs> no, nah, it wasn't quite like that. It was more like <laughs> your voice was trembling. You were so frightened. I could hear it. I could hear it in the back. I was washing up or something. And I thought, what was he crying about over there? What the hell has happened? No. Because I know what you thought. You thought, God oh, damn it, that no. five grand plus VAT. Nah, mate, I would have paid it, like, honestly. But No, I know, I know you did. And I just came out and looked at it. And you were like, what do you think? I was like, it's the Spider-Man. Oh. Oh, you were holding your heart. You were like, thank God. No, but <laughs> I was like, yeah. After that, I did so, you know. But I did think to myself after that, you didn't, I don't know, were you ever worried, though? Like, were you ever worried? No, nah, I trusted you. you. You said you said it with with what was in it. I can't even remember. You said there's no chance that's going to happen. I wouldn't have, and I trusted you 100%. I know, but Obviously, I, I am a salesman. Worried. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, nah, I, I, trust, I trust you, man. I, I, I don't think you would have put it in every single pan and boiled every pan out at the same time. Mm. which is what we did. You would have maybe done it in one little pan first. Yeah, no, in hindsight. But your pans came up really nice, didn't they? Oh, brilliant. I'm about to do it again now. We're close to the Christmas period. It built up a little bit, so I'm about to do it again. And again, it's not a plug. You know it's a great a great product. I've seen loads of positive stuff about it. Uh, oh. It isn't without hard work, though, which you did the first time, and I was hoping you'd come down again and do it. <laughs> really, you don't want to have to do that myself. But I do, but, I do think... Yeah, you, you need to put some elbow grease. Yeah, no, you've got to. Like, you know, and again, it goes back to the whole McDonald's thing. Like, I'm not being funny. When you see that these guys religiously clean out a deck of pans every day, like, yeah. and, and again, goes back to their staff aren't overly... Um, you know they're not uh, they're not skilled people. Right? You know again, not trying to be derogatory because I'm not. You know, no, no. You know, and yet they're doing it every day. So in rotation, once a week, their their pans are being cleaned because they've got so many of them. Yeah. And I just think you know. And then when people, yeah, did I tell you that one guy messaged me and he was like, oh, I'm not really happy with the pan cleaner. I was like, why? He goes, um, he goes, oh, I didn't clean it. Like adding vinegar and and um, sodium hydroxide. And I was like, well, that's what you do now. I was like, yeah. I said, oh, okay. Well. Uh, nothing's going to clean it like pure acid but yeah it's not acid that removes carbon acid removes metal that carbon is on yeah <laughs> and i've tried to explain that and i just you know what if you don't believe me man, what range what range did he have, have no just out of interest old traditional british range and, oh okay so it wasn't no yeah it's a worst one. case yeah we were, worst case it's a grander pop isn't it for a new pan but yeah. but still still a lot of, yeah you know I wouldn't want that to Oh, yeah, you know if, how, how did you deal with it? No, I just said to her, I was just like, you know, look, send me photos. And then he sort of said, Well, I did it twice in one day. And I thought to myself, Well, we how many times did we do it? Like, you know, that date. We, we were there all day. Like, and I was thinking, okay, twice in one day. And I was thinking, you know, and then I was thinking, I, I you get to the point where you you're not, you know, you know, it's a similar complaint to you. You just get to the point where is it worth arguing anymore? And if you didn't like it, nah, you didn't like it. No. And and Give them money back. I just thought, no, <laughs> I didn't it. even do that because I thought he bought it in good faith. And I believe that, every, no, and not only that, we've done 12 trials ourselves. Yeah. And then we've sold hundreds and hundreds of buckets. And the people that have come back to me and said, it's great, it's great, it's great. So I know the product works. And I think this, yeah, I just definitely. begrudge the fact that he felt like vinegar, neat malt flavor and vinegar, whatever you call it, you know, acetic wow. acid was better. Well, it, was that like the seven to one stuff? I think it was, and I think he just lobs one in neat, and I just thought, well, you know, <laughs> you know, and then uh, you know what people don't consider is you're breathing that stuff in, man. Like you know, you're boiling acid, you know, uh, you know, and I think that's the you know what one of my customers says to me. You know, I love the fact about yours is that the, the Sarah's pan clean is that I know I'm not breathing in anything that's a harming. Yeah, you know, and I think and yeah, I, definitely there was no smell or anything no. in the atmosphere. No, you had to scrub it. I think as long as people realise. Listen, you're going to have to go to work with it. You know, it isn't going to do it all for you. Well, the other thing to remember is carbon didn't accumulate itself. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That also <laughs> took time. Yeah. Not in one day. Yeah. Exactly. So, so that also took time, you know? So, yeah. you know, cool. and I think that's one of the key things that I like to talk about. So, yeah, that's our innovation this year. And I think everything else isn't really an innovation. Um, well, actually, the, the online shop is an innovation to some degree, I think. Um, you know, that, that is because up to, if I'm correct in saying, 
Is there any other supplies that you can buy direct from in that I, I, that form? I guess there is, but maybe not in that form. Um, but yeah, I don't think they're not that I know of. No, maybe not. No, maybe you mm. just have to bring up and do it the old-fashioned way. Maybe I don't know, but but no, I just think for us that was a big leap because you know no wholesaler is taking on new products at the moment. So if you bring them up and say, "Hey, we've got this great season rice flour. Hey, we've got this Sarah's." Pack. Yeah, that always that's always upset me about not you or your company, but some of the suppliers and the lack of them carrying your products, especially, I mean, you know, I've been using your products now, been six years at at my shop. I don't know how many years before my parents, a long time. It's got to be 10 years plus and back in the day. And then even, you know, some just don't hold this or haven't got that. And it's a pain in the ass. Well, now it doesn't matter. Yeah, no, exactly. And it doesn't matter. You just, you just get it. And that's the point. And, it, and we're, try, yeah. we're trying to fill the gap, as you know. Like you know, you order it and it comes, and it's there most of the time. Yeah, well, it works. It's good. It's a good idea. Not not uh, most of the know. time. It's with you next day for the most part. You know. Yeah. You know. So good. The, the, good work. The same questioner has said, "Ask Stephen." Do you use any of your products at home over Christmas? Now, we were laughing about this earlier because you were like, oh, I bet you don't. But I actually do. We use our fish cake mix at home quite a lot, Um, because especially when the kids were babies, because we'd always like make little fish cakes for them, whether it was salmon or whatever. Um, They don't eat fish cakes now, which is annoying. (laughs) (laughs) Can't even use the fish cake mix. But no, and and, um, but the gravy and the curry all the time. Yeah, all the time. And I don't know, you as yourself, do you ever use these things at home? Yeah. No, we we use a couple of things. As you know, I mentioned earlier, uh, Athena, my daughter, is uh, gluten intolerant. And uh, we we use the batter, which she loves, and uh, the fish cake mix because, you know, we make some sort of mozzarella sticks. She's into that sort of thing, you know, being that it's gluten-free with the, the gluten-free crumb. Yeah, it's a great product. Obviously, I have it at the shop, so why would I not use that? Why would I go and buy something else? I'm not being funny. Your products are really well-priced you know gluten free wise yeah i guess they are i suppose if you, you know the difference no, they are. For, for, well, <laughs> take it from me who buys gluten free products in the supermarket they can be really expensive yeah yeah bless her you just have to start sneaking in wheat into a diet nothing will happen <laughs> yeah no, I, we, I think one day we will but she's too young for that now. <laughs> yeah, i'm only joking i don't need to hurt you yeah. no no yeah you, you have to we need to know what, what, what yeah. it's all about so uh da, 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 da. oh we know who this is so I want to know, and this, you can tell who this is. I want to know if you're going to continue growing your product list, or are you happy where you are now? Um, I guess he means me, not you, Nick, because he didn't know you was coming on the podcast. Um, yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. I don't know if look if we see a product that needs to come out, we'll do it. If it don't, then we don't. We're not going to do it just for the sake of it. Um, we never stop, really. Like you know, I think this year alone, we did the pan cleaner. We did. The potato prep, we did the cloths, season flour, the season flour, season flour. Yeah, and 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 obviously because we've got the online store, you can turn them around faster. But again, it doesn't mean I'll do something just because. Um, there's got to be a clear need for it. I think what we want to do this year is we probably want to bring out one more product, and then we probably want to look at the packaging that we've got. And we've done that obviously with the fish cake mix. Well, it's not obvious to many because we've just started rolling that out. The fish cake mix is, is going out instead of in a tub, it's going out in smaller bags. Um, so there's what, why? Oh, just less waste, less waste, just, um, yeah. you know, for the product itself, you know, it, all the recipes, we've always worked the recipes around 500 grams. So now they're in 500 gram bags. It just, there's so many more. Yeah. So I think for us, it's just looking at all the pack sizes. You know, do we need a 10 kilo curry? Do we need this? Do we need that? And, you know, really, you know, looking at sort of getting rid of some plastics. Um, the same question I also asked, you know, why do we use um, a plastic tub for the gluten free? And again, because it's reusable, it's recyclable, um, it comes from recycled sources. It's white plastic, not black plastic. I didn't realize this, but black plastic is notoriously hard to recycle. Um, so I think everything has its reason, but I don't think I want to just innovate for the sake of it. No, no, innovate, you never innovate for the sake of it, but I don't want to bring out products for the sake of it. Uh, well, it'd be all more organic when something comes up, it's like that pan cleaner. I don't know how you came up with that, but I'd imagine it was an, organically, you know, you saw a need for it. I think you came up with I think it. It was just researching stuff. And when you research stuff, you think, yeah. oh, that's a great one. Like, that looks good. We don't do that over here. And again, I fancied something slightly different. 
So, um, yeah. More like, did that come more like from America? Would yeah, you say? I think it was. Yeah, I think it was American. Yeah. And, you know, especially. They're quite ahead of us, quite ahead of us aren't they? Yeah, yeah they, they are massive. They are massively. We're, we're, the Brits yeah. are, you know, I think even now, like, you see comments on the group saying, should I buy a filter machine? And you think, oh, hell, yeah, like, it's, it's 2020. In this day and age, like, if someone's not feeling their oil, that's unreal. Yeah, and you think it's 2021 in a week. Like, and you think, yeah, you know, right. you know, and I remember like someone telling me a story that in the seventies, they didn't have, th- well, maybe it was earlier, maybe the sixties, they didn't have thermostats on the range. So they used to flob, like spit in the pan. And if you, oh, yeah. and you think like, and, and you think like, maybe like, how can you still not have a filtration machine? Like, but I, you know, that's, yeah, that's not, not, like, grim as that, I'm but... not saying that to mock. I'm saying it because it is a true investment that you can see that pays for itself. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's going to pay for itself yeah. quickly. Yeah, like that's going to pay yeah, for itself massively. Um, and then, so uh, last couple of questions. Really, this question is something we talk about a lot. What would you avoid doing if you was opening a new shop now? And and obviously, we've sort of touched on a lot of these things. Um, so I I don't open a shop, and I probably ain't going to open a shop. So I'm going to leave this one to you, Nick. Oh, so what would I, sorry. Uh, what would you, what would you, what would I do? Yeah. Or what would you even not do? What, the, you know, you, you, you know. Well, yeah, I've definitely, I definitely made a lot of mistakes, like messing with my hours, putting things on the menu, taking off too quickly. Um, so I would definitely try and be more fixed on your hours because there's nothing worse than changing them and people getting, you know, upset about that menu you know sort of have an idea or or oh god i don't really want to say it but like mcdonald's they're very clever limited time only so customers can't get upset when it's on one week and then the next week they come or a month later and <clears throat> it's gone so i think i would definitely look at doing that if you if you want to see what works in your new shop you know do you know limited time only menu items be very careful with your times, you know, changing them. You don't you don't want to do that. Yeah. I think they're 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 the, the two main things I, I've made mistakes on personally so that would definitely look Essentially at. both of those are give whatever you've sort of set up, give it time before you reevaluate it. And and I think yeah. one of the things just to add to the open hour thing, like and we've got snow forecasted at some point and we've got storms and one thing I always see is that if you open and it's snowing outside, a lot of shops just close and say, stuff it. Mm. Whereas I know, again, someone like Mark Drummond would say you should never do that because what if someone did travel out in that perilous weather to come to you and you were closed? And I get his point and I get the shop owner's point as well. But I think, especially nowadays with Facebook, you should really put out messages saying, look, you know, we had to close, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, but then again, with, with click and collect and deliveries and all of that now, you know, if you're doing deliveries, maybe they're yeah. it anyway. So that's the beauty of the beauty of of you know what we do um, with it being strictly click and collect and deliveries. The the few times that it's been like a, a, a Thursday, and let's say I've run out of I'm running out of chips, and I've only got half an hour left, and I've only got one ticket on the board of a potential however many. You know what? Why not just shut the system down? Am I really going to go to the potato room and you know do all that just in case? No, yeah. just shut the system down. No one's coming to the door, or they shouldn't be. So in that sense, it works. But in the other sense, you know, obviously, yeah, you can't do that to customers. Customers that that will upset people. No one, doubt. one of the biggest things that I see a lot is you, you always see this thing on, on Facebook where they'll say, oh, what, what time do you, what, you know, the groups, what time do you stay open till? And they're like, I'll stop frying 15 minutes before. And, yeah, I don't get it. And someone said to me recently, they have two opening hours, one for the customers and one for the staff. Yeah. And for the customers, it says nine o'clock. For the staff, it says five past nine. Yeah. And he says he never like shut at nine o'clock. He'll always shut at five past. And the amount of extra money he makes across the year for that five minutes, and he never lets anyone who is rushing. Imagine if you're rushing, you've just finished work, you're starving. Yeah. You get there at like one minute past nine. And it's like, yeah. Oh. Like, and he said, like, it actually builds so much goodwill because the staff are there. Yeah. Like, What's five minutes? The staff are there. 
you know yeah. and and he, and he said like you know it builds up a lot of value you know and goodwill you know and money at the end of the year because you know if he sells two fish and chips within that five minutes it, it just makes a big difference you know and um Nah, good. That's that, I've never looked at it that way. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. We always do like it the other way, don't we? We five minutes early. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah. But last question, Nick, and we can. This is probably to both of us. Who do you both look up to in the industry? So if you want to go first, well, a few people. Um, I'll, I'll say it, even though it's going to give you a big head. You, you've been quite inspirational. Big, you've helped me a lot. Big, I'll, I'll say it. You know, you you have helped me out a fair amount more, you know, and that's sort of going up with the goodwill thing. You know, you've been very helpful. Your products are great too, and I wouldn't obviously just use them because you've been helpful, but that's helped as well with the goodwill. You're, I see you on, on social media helping people, even people maybe that aren't your customers. So, you know, you, you've been you've been a great help, and I, I thank you for that. Good opportunity to take to say it, I suppose. Obviously, you know, how can you not mention uh, Fred from uh, Shea Fred's? I mean, who doesn't that guy help? Let's be honest about it. That point. He, he, you ask Fred, you know, a question, he, he's going to help you. Probably going to get loads of messages now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. But, yeah, he, he's, he has been a great help. He, I mean, he's been there, seen so much, uh, runs an amazing business and, He's been great. Uh, Rob from Florigo, uh, even though I, you know, I own a Florigo, I'm not being funny. That that guy's smart. You know, you know, he's helped me. He he said about the virtual drive through six years ago. I should have listened then. You know, and and other things. He's he's he goes into a lot of shops. You know, and he sees a lot of lot of stuff. So he, he's a real good good person to chat to. And um, a guy, this guy that. His name's Kevin. I don't actually know his surname. Kev Hill. Which is, Kev Hill. Uh, he does look like yeah, being called Kevin, yeah. though. He says it sounds posh. Yeah. Okay. Well, Kev, as I, I, I refer to him, Kev, um, he runs a shop he doesn't own, and he's he's quite an inspirational guy. You know, you think he, he owned that shop. Um, but it's like, you know, you, you have your, your sort of inner circle of people that you, you're going to ask, you know, advice from, you know, for me, yourself, maybe Fred. Kev even to a point Rob I've called up Rob and asked him what 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 do you think I should do with this and I think we all we all need that in the industry where there's people that have got different skills have been in the industry longer or it's just good to get a different perspective on something you know like you know you said things today in this podcast I thought well you know what yeah I've never looked at it that way it makes and yeah one thing I'd say about your list so Fred if you uh, Fred's a good guy but if you're hungry yeah, and you've got no reservation, you're stuffed. Yeah, <laughs> I know what you're talking about. <laughs> because this guy will walk past restaurants when you're starving. <laughs> yeah, like, no, we're not going there, Stel. I can't do it. Yeah. We're not going there, Stel. I can't do it. Yeah. And then you know, and then it was that day at the awards. We were all together, weren't we? You came up and and yeah, like, oh, let's go for something to eat. And his favorite restaurant was fully booked or whatever. They couldn't get us in, like. And then he's like, oh, yeah. we'll go somewhere else. We literally, I was just starving at this point. Like, you know what I'm like, you know, because, you know. We, we travelled in like rush hour, didn't yeah. we, in London, trying to get on the train. And I've got the will. He's like, go on there, get on there. Get on there, get on there. And I've, I've on. got the willpower of Jack Diddley squat by this point. And like, <laughs> and then I remember like, I ate everything. And he was like, oh, that was shit. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. and I, it was, it was, it was, it was it and he goes, he goes, you can't talk, you ate it all. And I was like trying to make excuses. I was like, I was, like, I was yeah. doing filming, wasn't it? Yeah. And it was like, oh, it's going to be a long day. Oh, it's going to be a long day, man. Like it was, yeah, it was, a, long it was day. a long day. And and then um and he was like, he was laughing at me because he called me fat and he said, say all the food anyway, and it was shit. And then I remember the waiter comes over and says, was it nice? Yeah. <laughs> and Fred, Fred just ignored him. Like, and then I, I was like, yeah, thanks, mate. It was great. <laughs> you were like, <laughs> you said the Diet Coke's the best I ever had. Oh, God, I, I still remember it today. Um, but no. It was nice. It was really cold. <laughs> I enjoyed the Diet Coke. Yeah. You're the only guy to today that I know that has Diet Coke for breakfast. But, um, yeah. But no, Gets you going. regarding Kev, though, for a second, because, again, a lot of people wouldn't know a lot about him. Like, I think what I like about Kev a lot 
is um we do all have a good laugh with, and you know we've got that group message thing going off and he treats that shop like it's his own and uh, it's, yeah, it's fair better than his own like he cleans out those pans like he sent me photos the other day pride like really proud like cleans out those pans really happy you know he maintains a good product yeah he does care he does care and i think that says a lot and i think one day he'll be a natural shop owner and and, and oh definitely yeah. Definitely, a really good one of yeah. that. Really good. And I one. think that's what he's aspiring to. Um, Rob's a good lad. I know Rob really well. Um, I do also, and I'm not just saying it because he's another range manufacturer, but I do like Paul Williams. I, I get on really well with Rob and Paul in, in separate. Yeah, separate. I, I don't know. I don't know Paul yeah. at all. No, but yeah, Rob. Rob. What I like about Rob, though, you know, he he will come and sell you a range, obviously, but he will discuss a lot of other aspects yeah. of the business. To be fair, I think most. Yeah, I know that for sure. Yeah, but. That is, he's he's very knowledgeable. Yeah. I like that. I think for the most part, most people at that level are doing that. To be fair, like I think, but yeah, yeah. but but what I'd like to, so I think I probably people that I look up to as well. Like it's not always like you know. Again, it's like two normal lots of people that have had a really shit year on top of everyone else that's had a shit year. So you know, two mm. people I want to call out here is like it's Matt Bedford. Matt Bedford, like absolute great guy, been in the industry. Yeah. 10 years or so you know i've known him for a good few years and um but as, a, as an owner i think he's been in the industry about 10 years and you know it, i like his social media to be yeah honest. No, it's really good. it pushes me is it good yeah for, and you know it, i'm pretty sure he does it himself oh, yeah. and i like, I like it yeah, yeah. I, like, I like what he and does look, had, he, he, as a family had a pretty shit year and yet you know he still gets in every day does a good job well, for the most part every day he's got two shops he's juggling them doing a great job and and again Someone else I'd like to sort of say that again who's been doing a great job is Leslie and Des from Burton Road Chippy. You know, they they've had again another shit year from hell, like on top of everything else that everyone else has had, you know, arguments with sort of landlords and this, that, and the other. And you know, they've moved sites and you know, that that must take a toll on you, you know, and you think yeah. they're nice, they're nice people. Yeah. I only met them once at your the launch of your gloom free all them years ago. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm nice people, nice family. Ed said he doesn't like you. I'm just re relaying it once more. I, I don't blame him. I don't blame him. Yeah, he said you ate all his bread rolls. <laughs> I, I don't. I think I sat with Fred. Fred that day. That, I think that was one of the first times I met Fred. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that was a great event, and I'd love to have more like that because I think it's just a good. Event. Yeah, you should do more like that. Yeah. That was a, that really was a good event. Yeah, but yeah, we're not going to do lock, lockdown events. Well, yeah, obviously, yeah. How are you going to do it now? But yeah, Nick, I think we've we've covered loads of ground. I think we've not missed anything. It's going to be a long podcast, but I think it was always inevitable that it was going to be a long one with me and you. Um, and we spoke yeah, for longer on the phone, to be fair. Um, so <laughs> we spoke for longer on the phone, to be fair. Uh, yeah, I remember when yeah. when your daughter was just born, and I was on my way somewhere, and you're like, "What are you doing up?" And I don't know how I must have responded to a message from the night before, and you just ring me as you was like putting it to sleep or like giving us a milk we'd like talk for like four hours or something like but yeah you know but um yeah we might go to bed a lot earlier now though don't we getting on man getting on you yeah. know but i'll be up at four half four you know you know crazy i'm gonna be <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no you're more of a get up at 9 30 and just pretend you're gonna put 4 30 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. take photos and then like put 415 on it no but nick i'd like to say yeah thanks for coming on the sarah's podcast thanks for listening no worries, my i pleasure. force you lot to listen to it ahead of everybody else's podcast you know because you know how strong no I, I, I enjoy them i think this is a great thing for our industry the, you, you know you say uh you, another thing you didn't mention okay. was this you didn't you you innovated this yeah you're not the inventor of a podcast but no one in our industry came up with this, so that was, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I guess, but I never see that's that. I don't cool. know if I see it as a product, but I guess probably it could be seen as innovative. Well, it is, it is a product, and to be honest, I, I bet it's going to help a lot of people. Probably not this conversation, but <laughs> others have been very informative. Yeah. There's been some really good, yeah. good, there's been some great things. What, like, um, what was the one that we discussed? Oh, the one that, well, and some of them are quite funny, actually. I enjoyed that. that one you did with the guy, the guy in Wales, where he was talking to the Irish potato man. Huge. <laughs> yeah, he does. His, he does his potatoes, but he only works four days. And he goes, Tim, uh, why do you only work four days? He goes, Well, uh, I can't afford to. Um, 
only yeah. work three. <laughs> I thought that was brilliant. No, and I, that was that's great. what I like about the, the, the way that the, the podcast is going into a place now where people feel comfortable saying how they feel. And I think and I think maybe the early podcast, people are a bit protective, you know, and I get that too. Like, But now I think people are happy to just blurt out a swear word or say a joke like that. And, and uh, you know, and I think that's that's a nice thing that people feel comfortable. But that was a good one. I did enjoy that. I've enjoyed all yeah, of no, I, enjoy, I, I don't think I've ever felt sleepy in any of them, to be fair. I, 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 yeah, they, they were, they've all been good. I can't, I can't remember. You're close to 100 now. I think some 80 or something, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But yeah keep going. For those, keep those going. that have made it this far in, what podcast should they be listening to? Like, not mine. I mean, like, what would you recommend that others should be listening to? Uh, well, I can only tell them what I listen to, whether they like it or not. Obviously, uh, the Joe Rogan experience. I mean, if you're not listening to the Joe Rogan experience, you, you're missing a trick. You know, that guy has some amazing guests on. Listen to a great one about uh, COVID. He had a journalist on um, a few nights ago now. Fantastic. I like I like him a lot. Sorry, let me just look at my list. Actually, I've got I've got a lot, a lot of people that I like to listen to. Obviously, Mark Maron. We both, we both enjoy him a lot. Uh, Lex Freeman recently we started listening to him uh, Jocko obviously Jocko podcast and there's so many you know through the lockdown I started listening to Louis Theroux I mean <laughs> what a guy brilliant brilliant podcast but that's only a one white why whilst we're in lockdown but there's, there's loads whatever whatever you're into whatever subject you're into or hobby there's a podcast for it and it's a great time <laughs> You know, for me, prepping and listening to podcasts, I, I, I don't know what I did before then. Yeah, it, 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 it does make you wonder, what did I do before? Like, but a few podcasts that I... Yeah, I can't, I can't remember. A few podcasts that I'd recommend is um, Cautionary Tales by Tim Hartford. Absolutely love the guy. He's just he's an economist. He's amazing. Another one that he does by BBC is 50 Things That Made the Modern Economy. Again, amazing. Um cautionary tales is really good because it tells you about how we don't learn from things and yet we don't take the hints and we then do it again um and then bill gates and rashida jones ask big questions great podcast um there's just so many that i listen to the inquiry by the bbc joe rogan love joe rogan trade talks is great um but again anything from pushkin industries yeah yeah, from for the Cypriots out there, not mm-hmm. pushed in industry, it's Pushkin. And again, brilliant. Yeah. You know, um it's just such a great um oh, what's his name? Oh, Malcolm Gladwell. Anything with Malcolm Gladwell is worth listening to. Michael Lewis again, Pushkin Industries, it's amazing. Um they just you listen to them and your mind opens. You can you, you just think all this information is just flooding in. And but they're said in such a nice, calm way. And yeah, it's just but yeah, same I'd say that's the same with Joe Rogan as well, to be fair, because I think when when Benico Zaniu told me about Joe Rogan, I was at his house and he was like, Oh, well, look at this. And I think this is when I came away and we started listening to podcasts, and you said to me, Oh, you should do a podcast podcast and and i didn't really get oh, you know i was like yeah whatever but benico showed me him and initially i looked at joe rogan i thought well who is this meathead he's gonna be thick he's gonna be stupid like you, you know you look at it's that first like that first like initial look at the guy just think oh he's gonna be some meathead and yeah he was amazing like you know and he still is amazing like so yeah but on that note that yeah. those are the podcast i'd recommend so Oh, there's so many, they're, and they're brilliant. Like and like you said, I don't know what I did before they came yeah, out. No, definitely. Well, Nick, thank you for your time. It's gone past midnight. It's blazing outside, and uh, yeah, no doubt. No worries. Enjoyed it. Thank you very thank much you for coming on, man. <laughs>